By the name of God, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Sa'ad Safir, Musa bin Hamdan, Atai Safir, Sultanati Uman, Ladal Wilayat al-Mutahi del Amerikiya, Dr. Muhammad al-Aremi, Rais Jam'eet al-Sahafiyin al-Umaniya, Al-Asatida Sa'adat, Aydan, Adu Muglis al-Dawla, Hatim Atai, Al-Asatida, Al-Professoriya, أعضاء سفارة سلطنة عمان في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية أيها الأصدقاء أهلا ومرحبا بكم إلى هذه الجلسة في إطار ملتقى الملتقى الإعلامي العماني الأمريكي في حقيقة الأمر هذه هذا الملتقى هو محطة أخرى للولوج إلى علاقات ممتدة تاريخيا إلى أكثر من 200 سنة بين سلطنة عمان والولايات المتحدة الأمريكية وهي محطة بالتأكيد ستفتح الباب إلى آفاق جديدة حضارية ثقافية سياسية uh, I hope that I talk in English also but there we have translator here okay. yeah please so uh, good morning everyone uh, thank you uh, all these thank you for, for being here uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Ambassador uh, Musa Hamdan uh the Sultan of Oman, uh, Ambassador to the United States of America, uh, as well as our uh, Mohammed Rubey from head of the uh, Sultan uh, Journalist Association, our uh, distinguished guest. Uh, this is another. Uh, this is another station, another milestone in our relationships between the two people, the, 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 the two countries and the people of the, the, these two countries, which dates back to more than 200 years. Uh, and I'm very happy to, to, to receive you today here. Thank you. We will start with two papers right now with uh, Professor Mohammed al Aremi and uh, Professor Alan. So um, we welcome. نحن نرحب دكتور محمد فضل بداية. بتب من هناك ولا هنا؟ آه عفوا. Okay, uh, they are speech uh, also for uh, his excellency. Um, ليتحدث عن كثير من الأشياء التي مفروض نحن نقولها الآن. و... وقفوا. عادي. فسعد سفير تفضل ليلقى كلمته. هاي كلمتك هي. السلام عليكم جود مورنينج. السلام. I know that time has passed for my uh, opening remarks that's why he he was trying to skip me a little bit. <laughs> but we had a technical problem I didn't I didn't cause it. It's just by luck. Like, I'll be giving uh, just short remarks and uh, I will be speaking in both Arabic and English so I will start with Arabic and then I will translate myself a little bit. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Sabah al khair jamian. Shukran lakum jamian ala musharakatkum lana fi hadha al multaqa al sahafi al umani al amriki aladi yahdif لتعزيز العلاقات المتميزة بين سلطنة عمان والولايات المتحدة الأمريكية الصديقة ويسرني مرة أخرى الترحيب بوفد جمعية الصحفيين العمانية في العاصمة واشنطن وفي مركز السلطان قابوس للثقافة في واشنطن مقدرين اهتمامكم بزيارة الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية لا شك أن وجودكم هنا بهذا العدد عامل مساعد للعلاقات الودية التي تربطنا مع الولايات المتحدة ويسعدني تواجدكم وتواصلكم مع نظرائكم من الولايات المتحدة الذي يسهم كثيرا في تعزيز هذه العلاقات التي نحتفل بها اليوم ينعقد الملتقى في مركز السلطان قابوس الثقافي في واشنطن الذي يمثل جسر للتبادل الثقافي بين أمريكا من جهة وسلطنة عمان والعالم العربي من جهة أخرى حيث يقوم المركز على مدار العام بتقديم مجموعة من البرامج منها تدريس اللغة العربية وامسيات أدبية وثقافية 
ويدعم البحوث العلمية ونشر مخرجاتها كما يفتح المركز أبوابه للباحثين وطلاب المدارس ويتعاون لتحقيق برامجه مع عدد كبير من المؤسسات النظيرة والشركاء علاقات سلطنة عمان والولايات المتحدة ضاربة في القدم ويشترك البلدان في مصالح وأهداف إقليمية ودولية متعددة بما في ذلك السلام والاستقرار الإقليمي والأمن والتنمية الاقتصادية والتجارة كما يرتبط البلدان بعدد من الاتفاقيات الاستراتيجية المتجددة التي تسهم في تدعيم التعاون الثنائي في مختلف المجالات وتطويرها يأتي انعقاد المنتقى الصحفي العماني الأمريكي لتعزيز علاقات الصداقة التاريخية بين سلطنة عمان والولايات المتحدة الأمريكية ومن بين أفضل السبل لتعزيز مثل هذه العلاقات المتميزة وعكسها على الواقع هو فرص اللقاء والتواصل المباشر بين الشعوب الذي نشهده اليوم وتتيح أوراق العمل التي يقدمها نخبة من الجانبين في, جل في خلال جلسات الحوارية المشتركة فرصة للمزيد من التواصل الثقافي والتحاور الإنساني وتسليط الضوء على ما يجمع بيننا من قواسم أسهمت في تقوية العلاقات وتنويعها واستدامتها على مدى السنوات وتفتح آفاق جديدة للمزيد من التعاون في مختلف المجالات شكرا لاستماعكم Good morning again to everyone Thank you for your participation in this Oman American Press Forum which aims to strengthen the excellent relations between the Sultanate of Oman and the friendly United States of America I am pleased once again to welcome the delegation of the Oman Journalist Association in Washington. And at the Sultan Qaboos Culture Center, appreciating their interest in visiting the United States of America. This forum being held at the Sultan Qaboos Culture Center in Washington, which represents a bridge for culture exchange between America, on the other hand, and the Sultanate of Oman and the Arab world on the other. Throughout the year, the Sultan Qaboos Culture Center provides various programs, including teaching Arabic language, hosting literary and culture evenings, supporting scientific research, and publishing its outputs. The center welcome researchers, the center welcome researchers and school students, and it cooperates to achieve this with a large number of counterpart and partner institutions. The United States of America and the Sultanate of Oman enjoy historical relation. The two countries share common regional and international interests and goals. They have signed various strategic agreements to facilitate bilateral cooperation. The Omani American Press Forum strives to enhance these friendly relations as the personal exchange and people-to-people -people contact further develops such friendly relations. The presentations during the Press Forum provide an opportunity for more culture exchange and dialogue and shed more light on what brings us together, which has contributed to strengthening diversif diversifying and sustaining our relations over the years and opening new horizon for more cooperation in the future. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Saad Safir, for this beautiful words that also connected ماضي العلاقات بالحاضر وإن شاء الله بالمستقبل كما نعلم جميعا بأن العلاقات العمانية الأمريكية هي علاقات ممتدة وعلاقات قامت على أسس مهمة جدا خاصة في المجال السياسي وفي المجال الاقتصادي
هذه المحاور ستكون إن شاء الله في أوراق العمل خلال هذا اليوم وأيضا خلال المساء ونبدأ مع الدكتور محمد بن حمد العريمي وهو دكتوراه الفلسفة في التربية من جامعة عين شمس وخبير إعلامي بهيئة حماية المستهلك وهو محاضر أكاديمي في كلية الشرق الأوسط وطبعا في ورقته س نشهد الكثير من الأمور الخاصة فيما يتعلق بالعنوان الرئيسي وهو العلاقات التاريخية العمانية أيضا العمانية الأمريكية أيضا فيما يتعلق بالدكتور محمد العريمي هو شخص باحث ولديه كثير من الكتابات فيما يتعلق بكتابة التاريخ والتأريخ في عمان وأيضا في المنطقة العربية وعلاقات عمان بالخارج Uh, thank you so much, Your Excellency, for your uh, opening remarks about uh, the relations between the two countries, uh, Oman Central and the United States of America. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you one of our uh, presenters, Mr. Dr. Mohammed bin Hamad al Uremi. Uh, Dr. Mohammed is a doctor; he has a doctor in philosophy in education from Ain Shams University, and a media expert at the Consumer Protection Authority. Uh, Dr. Muhammad is an academic lecturer at the Middle East College uh, from 2012 to 2017. Al-Urami is a former writer in the Oman newspaper on the vision and supervisor of the historical section of the Athir, Athir website. Uh, he has published a book, The History of uh, Sur al-Bahr uh, al-Mirawi, in partnership with the researcher Sheikh Hamoud bin Hamad al-Ghilani. Uh, and the book entitled Al Wali Ismail. He is very interested in, in, in history actually and he's been written about the history of Oman. Thank you so much. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد سعادة السفير الحضور الكرام في البداية طبعا نتقدم بالشكر الجزيل إلى سفارة سلطنة عمان في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية إلى المركز الثقافي مركز سلطان قابوس الثقافي إلى جمعية الصحفيين على إتاحة هذه الفرصة لي للحديث عن محطات في تاريخ العلاقة بين عمان والولايات المتحدة الأمريكية Your Excellency, uh, our distinguished guests, I'd like to welcome you all uh, to attend this uh, forum. And I'd like to uh, thank the Embassy of the Sultan of Oman, as well as the Cultural Center, and uh, everybody who put efforts into uh, this great uh, gathering. Uh, I, my discussion will be about stations, some stations, some milestones in the, uh, relation, the historical relationships between uh, Oman and uh, United States of America. هناك عناوين عديدة ومحطات كثيرة عندما نتحدث عن العلاقات بين سلطنة عمان والولايات المتحدة الأمريكية وبالأخص خلال الفترة ما بين 1833 حتى 1970 تأكيدا لا نستطيع أن نحصر أو أن نتوقف عند كل محطة بشكل تفصيلي حاولت قدر الإمكان أن أركز على أبرز هذه المحطات تجاوزت محطات معينة لأني عرفت أن هناك من سيتحدث فيها في البداية أنا عادي ممكن أكون هنا Thank 
you. So um, I'll be talking about some milestones and stages in the relationships between the two countries, uh, starting from 1833 until 1970. And actually, there has been so many milestones that we need to discuss, but I'll be skipping some of these because of the short time. Thank you. يعني عندما نتحدث عن بداية العلاقات يعني عندما نتحدث عن بداية العلاقات العمانية الأمريكية أولا هي بشكل عام بالنسبة لنا كعمان تعد علاقة حديثة لماذا؟ لأن الحضارة العمانية حضارة ضاربة في الأعماق لدينا علاقات مع شروب أخرى قديمة الفرس الهنود العرب وغيرهم لكن عندما نتحدث ايضا عن خصوصيه هذه العلاقه نحن نعد الدوله الثانيه في العالم التي او في الوطن العربي الذي ارتبطنا بعلاقه مع الولايات المتحده الامريكيه لان الولايات المتحده الامريكيه ككيان سياسي حديث يعني من حوالي 250 عام actually we consider our relationships with the United States of America a new one because the United States is a new country where we have actually uh, our, our relationship with our nations goes back, dates back for centuries and centuries like with the Persians, uh, Indians, but um, there are some uh, specialities of this relationship with the United States of America. We are the second one, the second Arab country which built the relations and ties with the United States of America and also uh, the, horizons of, uh, the horizons of this uh, relationship. تعود أقدم إشارة إلى التواصل بين الطرفين إلى الفترة التي حصلت فيها الولايات المتحدة على استقلالها في عام 1783 أخذت السفن الأمريكية تجوب البحار الشرقية بحثا عن علاقات تجارية مع موانئ الشرق تشير التقارير إلى أن أول سفينة أمريكية وصلت مسقط هي المركب الشراعي رامبرل من بوسطن بقيادة القبطان روبرت فولجر وكان ذلك في أوائل سبتمبر 1790 زمن الرئيس الأمريكي جورج واشنطن. So uh, the signals for this uh, old relations between the two countries goes back uh, to days where the United, United States getting its independence, it getting independent. In 1783, uh, these American scoop of wars were going through these uh, seas overseas and uh, looking for uh, trade relations with uh, different harbors and different countries in the East. Uh, the reports mentioned that the first American, uh, um, American boat that reached uh, Muscat, it was the Rambler, Rambler from Boston uh, with the captain Robert Folger, and that was up around the early uh, September of 1790. ازداد حجم النشاط التجاري الامريكي بالاتجاه نحو شرق افريقيا بدءا من العام 1820 قبل ذلك كان في توقف لماذا 1812 كانت في حرب ايام الرئيس جيفرسون وايضا صار في حظر للتجاره الخارجيه في 1820 او ابتداء من هذا العام بدات الحركه التجاريه تعود بدا التجار الامريكيين بالتزايد في منطقه شرق افريقيا حتى انه في 1833 كان من بين عدد السفن الثلاث عشر التي رصد في ميناء زنجبار تسع سفن أمريكية لكي تتوسع حجم التجارة مع الشرق اقترح التجار الأمريكيون وعلى رأسهم وهذا الرجل له دور مهم جدا في, في اتفاقية الصداقة أو اتفاقية التجارة 1833 وهو أدموند روبرتوس أشاروا بضرورة التنسيق مع السيد سعيد السلطان حاكم مسقط وفعلا تم عقد اتفاقية uh, the, the, the size of the American trade uh, has increased uh, tremendously uh, towards the Middle East uh, and, and toward the uh, east of Africa since 1820. The American traders uh, started to broom around these areas. Uh, among, among 13 uh, boats that uh, harbored in the Zanzibar at the time, Nine of them were American uh, ships. Uh, and, and in order to, to, to increase and to expand these uh, trades with the Americans and headed by Captain Edmund Roberts, and actually this, this man will play a big role in the, in the tags and also in the Treaty, tre treaty of Amity between the Sultan and, and, and the United States. And actually the, 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 the treaty was signed on September 1833. نأتي إلى معاهدة الصداقة والتجارة ونعتبرها أبرز أو أول محطة من محطات العلاقات بين الطرفين تعد هذه المعاهدة التي وقعت في 1833 
هي البداية للنشاط التجاري الأمريكي في منطقة الخليج العربي وبداية العلاقات الرسمية بين عمان وبين الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية وقعها عن الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية الكابتن أدمون روبرتوس مع السيد سعيد سلطان عمان في 21 سبتمبر 1833 يعني هذه المعاهدة كان لها قصة عجيبة وغريبة وقصة روبرتوس وكيف وصل وكيف تعرض إلى بعض الصعوبات وكيف أشاد أو ارتاح لتعامل السلطان سعيد معه الذي عوضه عن بعض خسائره وبالتالي هو كان اوصى بايجاد العلاقه uh, معه. The Treaty of Amity and uh, Trade 1833 this is the start of the activities of trade activities between uh, the United States and the, and the Gulf Arabian Gulf as, as a whole and also the formal the official relationships between Sultanate of Oman and the United States of America, and that was during the Sayyid Said bin Sultan's uh, era. Uh, the, the treaty was signed by the, for the United States of America by Captain Edmund Roberts with the Sayyid, uh, Sayyid Sultan from uh, Muscat, Oman, in September 21st, 1833. Uh, بمقتضى المعاهدة اتفق الطرفان على عدة بنود من بينها تحديد الضرائب المستحقة على البضائع الأمريكية 5% أسوة بالإنجليز. أيضا الاتفاق على تعيين عدد من القناصر سنأتي على ذكرهم يتم اختيارهم من قبل الرئيس الأمريكي لكي يستقروا في موانئ مسقط كان من بين بنود هذه الاتفاقية هو حماية القناصر أيضا خولت حاكم مسقط بمراقبة هؤلاء القناصر في حالة مخالفتهم قوانين البلاد وإعلام الولايات المتحدة بذلك لكي يتم استبدالهم على الفور uh, According to this treaty uh, Treaty of uh, Amity and uh, Trade uh, the both parties agreed on uh, on, on the assigning or uh, allocating the, 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 the taxes on, on the American uh, commodities, and actually that was 5%, uh, just like with the UK uh, in the Muscat uh, harbors, and also uh, customs and duties. Uh, and also they, they, they agreed on uh, appointing uh, council generals that could that be selected by the president of the United States of America, and that will be in, harbor, uh, in Muscat harbors. Uh, I, one of these articles and provisions of this uh, agreement was about protecting these consul generals, uh, which, uh, which gave the authority to the Muscat uh, rule uh, to authorities to monitor these consul generals in case they, viol they violate local, local rules and regulations. The United States of America will be informed of these violations in order to be, to be replaced with others. تعد هذه الاتفاقية هي بداية بداية للنشاط التجاري الأمريكي في المنطقة الخليج العربي ظل ظلت سارية حتى 20 سبتمبر أو 20 ديسمبر آسف 1958 عندما أبطل مفعولها واستبدلت بمعاهدة أخرى كانت هذه الاتفاقية كسبا سياسيا مهما بالنسبة للسيد سعيد لأنها كانت اعترافا أمريكيا بأهميته وأهمية بلاده في الوقت الذي بدأت فيه العلاقات الرسمية بين بلاده والولايات المتحدة بالإضافة إلى الأهمية المعنوية أيضا له. So uh, this agreement uh, it started the, 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 the trade activity between with the United States in the, the, the place and it was really a great achievement a great a political achievement for Mr. Said. Uh, because this is what the acknowledgement of, by the United States of this, uh, the, the importance of him and as well as the importance of Sultanate of Oman, uh, in, in, in where this relation, the official relations started to grow up. Uh, and actually, it was a great achievement for him. أيضا كان وقع هذه الاتفاقية في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية طيبا تمت مصادقة كل من الرئيس أندرو جاكسون ومجلس الشيوخ دون إبطاء لأنها لم تحمل الولايات المتحدة أي التزامات نحو سلطنة مسقط وعمان كما أن الولايات المتحدة قد أصبحت مرتبطة بصداقة إحدى الدول الأسوية التي تفخر بامتلاكها أسطولا كبيرا لا يقل عن 75 سفينة كذلك عملت الاتفاقية على ازدهار التجارة الأمريكية في ممتلكات السلطنة الأفريقية أكثر من السلطنة الأسيوية أقصد بها زنجبار على حساب مسقط فتزايد عدد السفن الأمريكية التي ترسو في زنجبار والتي تحمل كان من بين أبرز السلع التي تأتي من أمريكا قماشا قطنيا أمريكيا متينا متينا شاع استعماله في زنجبار والخليج العربي إلى جانب بيع البارود uh the, the, the treaty was received very well, uh, very well by the United States of America, President Andrew Jackson, and also as well as with the Senate, uh, because it really didn't give, uh, didn't oblige the United States of America too much uh, 
to, to, the, to, to Muscat and Amman, uh, as well as uh, the, the, this gave an opportunity for the United States of America to have uh, relations with one of these Asian countries, or the Middle East, the, the Asian countries, that has, that's very proud of having a large fleet of ships, uh, which, which, which was not less than 75 of them. Uh, the, the, the agreement made the American trades blooming in the area, in, in, in this, uh, in the area, uh, and actually in more, gave, gave it more blooming in, in Muscat. So the American ships actually that was been harbored in Zanjibar, uh, it began to increase and increase uh, gradually. And these were most uh, having U.S. commodities, especially like cottons and uh, clothes, uh, as well as uh, the barrels. في المقابل كانت أبرز البضائع الأمريكية وقتها البضائع العمانية العاج صمغ الكوبال الذي يستخدم في تحضير الطلاء والقرنفل خلال هذا نتيجة لهذه الاتفاقية خلال الفترة من سبتمبر 32 إلى مايو 34 وصلت إلى زنجبار 41 سفينة تجارية من بينها 32 سفينة أمريكية مقابل سبع سفن بريطانية واحدة فرنسية واحدة أسبانية أما ميناء مسقط لأن حركة التجارة بها وقتها كانت أقل وصلت تسع سفن تجارية أمريكية خلال السنة الأولى من المعاهدة. And in return from the Zanzibar, Zanzibar, the silk commodity has been exported, been exported. During the the September 1832 to May 1834, 41 ships, been trading ships, arrived in Zanzibar. 32 among them were American, compared to. Seven of them were from UK, one from France, and the other from Spain. As for Muscat, because it was just starting to bloom, in, uh, it, it, uh, uh, it, it received nine uh, American trading ships. During the first, uh, he says, I'm talking about the first year of the trade, the treaty. طبعاً أدمون روبرتوس اللي هو عراب هذه المعاهدة لم يعيش طويلاً ليجني ثمار جهوده توفي في ماكاو بعد إصابته بمرض الزحار الذي أصابه عند وصوله إلى سيام قادماً من مسقط في 12 يونيو 1836. Unfortunately, that man Roberts was the patriot of the patron for this relation, the sponsor for this relations. He 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 didn't live too much to see the blooms and the fruit of this relations. He he died in June 12, 1836. هذه كان صورة من 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 المعاهدة هذه المعاهدة هي بنود عديدة هذه هذا نموذج من هذه البنود. The 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 treaty comes with so many provisions and articles. This is just a copy of one of these. Edmund Robertus صورة له. Mr. Edmund Robertus. نأتي إلى محطة أخرى وهي محطة مهمة رحلة السفينة السلطانة السفينة السلطانة التي وصلت إلى نيويورك في 1840. لماذا هذه الرحلة؟ تماشيا مع السياسة الودية بين الإمبراطورية العمانية والولايات المتحدة بعث السيد سفين سعيد سفينته المسمى سلطانة في رحلة إلى ميناء نيويورك 1840 لتقوية العلاقات وشراء بعض الأسلحة التي كان بحاجة إليها تولى قيادة السفينة ربان بريطاني اسمه ويليام سليمون واختار السيد سعيد أمين سره الخاص أحمد بن النعمان الكعبي ليكون ممثلا له حمل الحاج أحمد بن النعمان هدية سيد سعيد للرئيس الأمريكي وكانت عبارة عن جوادين عربيين وبعض الجواهر وسيف مطعم بالذهب إلى جانب بعض العطور. In accordance with this friendly relationships and politics from the Oman Emperor and also from the United States, His Excellency Mr. Sayed sent us a ship with gifts called Sultana ship. Sent to New York in 1840 in order to 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 strengthen these ties as well as to buy some weaponries that he needed for his country. The the ship was led by a British captain called William Sleman. Mr. Said chose his private secretary to 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 represent him, and he has so many gifts with him for the era for the United States president. Uh, and these included two Arabian uh, original horses, some jewelries, um, um, and as well as um, some perfumes, Arabian perfumes. 
آه الرئيس الامريكي بدوره اهدى السيد سعيد آه باخره كبيره مؤثثه بافخر الاثاث الى جانب اربع مسدسات تلقائيه الدوران وبندقيتي بندقيتين تلقائيتي الطلق كما حملت السفينه سلطانه اكثر من ألف من اجله التمر العماني وحوالي 20 باله من السجاد الايراني والسجاد الفارسي ما اكيس من قهوه مخا بالاضافه الى كميات من انياب العاج وصبغ الكوبال والقرنفل آه كل هذه البضائع كان الامريكان معتادين عليها لانهم كانوا ياتون بها من افريقيا، ما عدا السجاد الفارسي الذي كان هو اكثر من اكثر الاشياء الذي اثار انتباه آه الامريكان. The American president in return uh, gave gifts uh, to Mr. Said, one of them was a big ship furniture with everything in new ones, as well as four uh, revolving automatic guns. These were automated very new for the for the for the time, as well as two rifles, automatic ones. Uh, and also the, the ship uh, Sultana has uh, the best dates from Oman, uh, as well as uh, Persian rugs, uh, more than uh, 20 bags of them, as well as uh, the Arabian coffee uh, as a gift. Uh, <laughs> موضوع آخر مهم لا يمكن تجاهله ونحن نتحدث عن العلاقات العمانية الأمريكية وهو موضوع التبشير النشاط التبشيري في عمان وكيف بدأ طبعا بدأ هذا النشاط التبشيري نهاية عام 1888 بإحدى كنائس مدينة نيو برونزيك في ولاية نيو جيرسي صادق مجموعة من الشبان الأمريكيين المتحمسين على تأسيس منظمة تدعى الإرسالية العربية هدفها الرئيس هو التبشير بالمسيحية في منطقة الخليج والجزيرة العربية بدأ نشاط الإرسالية في عمان بوصول القس الأمريكي هذا علامة بارزة في مجال التبشير في عمان وهو بيتر زويمر إلى مسقط في 12 نوفمبر 1893 لإنشاء مركز تبشيري بها وتحديد نوع النشاط المناسب لسكان المنطقة وأثمرت هذه الزيارة عن إنشاء مركز للإرسالية في مسقط Uh, and about the evangelism uh, activities in the uh, Oman, after long and uh, after long uh, discussions in 1888 in one of these uh, churches in New Brunswick, uh, in New Jersey State, a group of uh, young Americans uh, agreed on establishing an NGO called the Arabian Missionary. Uh, that was about evangelism in. Uh, about Christianity or uh, spreading Christianity in the uh, Gulf and also the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, the activities uh, started uh, in officially in Amman uh, through the a priest, a, a United States priest called uh, Peter J. Zumer, uh, who went to Muscat in November 12, uh, 1893. He came from the missionary in uh, Bahrain uh, in order to, uh, to see if they can uh, uh, build or establish uh, missionary there uh, and how what's what are the best activities to be done and to raise awareness among the locals لماذا اختارت الارساليه العربيه مسقط طبعا تم اختيارها باعتبارها البوابه الشرقيه لشبه الجزيره العربيه صمويل زويمر هو اخ بيتر زويمر قال مركز مسقط مثل كل مراكزنا الاخرى اختيرت بحكمه وعنايه لتكون مركزا استراتيجيا للوصول الى الداخل ان اهميه مسقط تنمو لدينا بازدياد كل ما تعرفنا اكثر على عمان الداخل نتذكر ان خطا ساحليا يزيد على 500 ميل تتصل فيه القرى ويسهل الوصول اليها من مسقط اذا مسقط كانت قاعده للولوج الى الداخل العماني So Muscat became like a base, a uh, headquarters to go through the, the whole country. The missionary uh, chose Muscat very carefully to establish uh, its uh, headquarters there, which was called the third, the third one, the third missionary in the, in the Gulf. And this comes after Basra, the one in Basra and the other one in Bahrain. Uh, because uh, Muscat is the, 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 the eastern gate uh, for the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, Samuel Zoymer, uh, the priest, said that Muscat has been chosen very carefully, just like we chose other uh, locations, other places, because it want, we want it to be a strategic place where we can go inside from there. Uh, the Muscat's importance uh, will increase, and its importance will increase more and more, uh, because it, uh, it reached uh, a coastline which is more than 500 miles long. 
uh, and all being, uh, there's been so many villages across uh, within this uh, long, which can be very, uh, which is very accessible and can be, can be easily reached from Muscat. ركز العمل التبشيري منذ بداياته في مسقط على ثلاث نقاط مهمة بيع الأناجيل والكتب التجوال والرحلات قاسم التجوال والرحلات الوعظ والتعليم هناك عوامل شجعت المبشرين على التوجه إلى عمان موقعها المميز وقوعها على طرق التجارة المناخ المقبول نوعا ما أيضا وجود النفوذ البريطاني اللي كان موجود أيضا سهل له المهمة تشجيع عدم معارضة النظام الحاكم كان في تسامح من قبل حكام عمان بالإضافة إلى الحاجة إلى التعليم والطب بسبب ظروف الجهل وظروف الأمراض المنتشرة وقتها في عمان uh, the, the evangelist uh, activities were based on three in Muscat, uh, uh, providing, selling uh, all the New Testaments, uh, traveling uh, and guide, as well as teaching, preaching, and uh, education. Uh, there are several things that encourage these uh, evangelists to, 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 to go to, to Amman. Be, in addition to its uh, excellent uh, location, and also it's been a crossroad for the international trade, as well as the, the climate, uh, all these encouraged the missionary to go there. And also they, they found a very uh, positive and uh, that encouraged them to stay and work from Amman, and including the, the UK influence uh, that the, the, the ruling government didn't uh, oppose it, their existence and their uh, establishing this uh, uh, basis. And also the people needed education, they're raising their awareness and because of the illiteracy, uh, it, it, and because of the people needed the medication as well. ناتي الان الى ابرز ما 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 قدمته او ما قامت به هذه المراكز اذا انا بنتقل الى محطه اخرى بنتقل احنا كنا نريد نتحدث عن نشاط في مجال التعليم وفي مجال الطب وأبرز المحطات نأتي إلى عهد السلطان سعيد بن تيمور ونتحدث عن رحلة غدا يعني يوم الغد 10 مارس السلطان سعيد بن تيمور في عام 1938 كان عند الكونغرس الأمريكي نتحدث عن هذه الرحلة رحلة السلطان سعيد إلى الولايات المتحدة 1938 وصل السلطان سعيد إلى سان فرانسيسكو في جزء من رحلة عالمية بدأها بالهند وشرق آسيا وأوروبا ثم وصل إلى الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية في الخامس من فبراير 1938 في زيارة رسمية رافقه كل من سكرتيره الخاص السيد الشاعر هلال بن بدر البوسعيدي ومساعده السيد عبد المنعم الزواوي خلال وجودهم في سان فرانسيسكو في كاليفورنيا رتبت لهم رحلات لزيارة هوليود شيكاغو ديترويت. It's been given to Dr. Mohammed to tell him that because of the short of time, so we have to skip so many these presentation pages. So one of the things he we wanted to mention was about education and other milestones. He says this is very important, but because of short of the time, he just skipped all of these and he goes to the Sultan Said's travel to the United States of America in 1938. Uh, Sultan Said were arrived at San Francisco in uh, February 5th, 1938, in an official visit. Uh, he has his uh, uh, private sec secretary with him, Mr. Hilal bin Badr, as well as his assistant, Abdul Manim Imam Zawi. And we, while they were in the United States, they, they, are, they have arranged for him visits to Hollywood, Chicago, and Detroit. في 10 مارس وصل السلطان ومرافقوه إلى واشنطن حيث استقبلهم كورديل هيل. بالمناسبة أنا اليوم نزل فيلم وثائقي قديم لاستقبال كورد هيل للسلطان سعيد بن تيمور أمام الكابيتول وفي اليوم الثاني استقبلهم الرئيس الأمريكي روزفلت في البيت الأبيض دارت المباحثات بين الجانبين حول احتمال وجود النفط في السلطنة وكذلك إعادة النظر في بنود المعاهدة الأمريكية مع مسقط عام 1833 
كان السلطان سعيد يرغب في تعديل البند الخاص بنسبة الرسوم الجمركية على البضائع والتجار الأمريكيين في الموانئ العمانية. In March 10th, Sultan arrived in Washington D.C. Here, he was received by the Secretary of State then, Mr. Cordo Hall. And on the second day of his visit here in Washington D.C., he was received by the American President Roosevelt in White House. And he said he has a short documentary movie he'd like to show you later about Cordo Hall receiving receiving Sultan. The 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 dialogue between these two parties it was about. Uh, the opportunity of finding oil in uh, Sultana, as well as reviewing some of these the treaties with the um, the treaty between states and, and the Muscat in 1833. Uh, actually, the Sultan Said was he wanted to make some editing or some changes and some amendments to the uh, to the provision about the ta customs and duties on the U.S. Uh, commodities as well as uh, traders. من جانبها حرصت الحكومة الأمريكية على أن ترافق السلطان حفيدة أول قنصل أمريكي لدى السيد سعيد بن سلطان الذي سبق وأن وقع معه أول اتفاقية بين الطرفين لم يتم خلال الزيارة توقيع أي اتفاقية جديدة بينهما غادر السلطان نيويورك على ظهر الباخرة كوين ماري متوجها إلى إنجلترا التي وصلها في 28 مارس يبدو أن هذه الرحلة لم تحقق النجاح المأمول لم تكن سوى التزام من الطرفين بالطلب الذي تقدم به السلطان قبلها لزيارة الولايات المتحدة في مارس 37 ردا على زيارة السفير الأمريكي في بغداد إلى مسقط 1934. The United States government made sure that Sultan will be accompanied by the grandson of the first American consul general in the Sultan of Oman. Who has signed the, the agreement between these two parties? Uh, the, 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 during the visit, actually, there was no uh, treaty or no uh, new agreement has been signed between the two parties. The Sultan Said left New York uh, on Queen Mary uh, ship and went going to the UK, uh, he, and he arrived there on uh, 28 Mars. Uh, to, uh, actually, uh, it, it was a hysterical uh, visit. But it didn't come. Uh, it didn't come a fruit with a, uh, an agreement between the two parties, and actually it was like more paying back a visit that done by the American ambassador in, to Baghdad. Uh, he visited Muscat in 1934. So this was just like a returning a favor of uh, visiting to, to the United States. <laughs> هذه إحدى المراسلات اللي هو يطلب فيها السلطان إنه السماح له ب ب بزيارة الولايات المتحدة. So these are some of these documents about the correspondence between the two parts about Sultan sending letters about to the United States about his planned visit to the United States. مثلا الوفد المرافق له من هم؟ His accompanying delegation, the delegation that accompanied him. نماذج من واشنطن تايمز نماذج من التغطيات الصحفية لزيارة السلطان. Some media coverage about the visit of the Sultan Said to the United States. معاهدة 1858 هذه المعاهدة في 20 ديسمبر 1958 كانت لتعديل المعاهدة. السابقة 1833 بشكل عام كي نختصر هذه المعاهدة يعني أخذت وقتا طويلا في الإعداد لها ولكن بنودها لم تظهر سوى بعد ذلك بعد حوالي 12 عاما 1970 عندما قامت النهضة المباركة وبدأ ظهور النفط هنا بدأت نتائج أو بنود هذه المعاهدة تفعل بشكل واضح So there was this agreement uh 1958 agreement and actually it took some 10 to 12 years to see the fruits or the results of this agreement after finding oils and oil fields so after the the, the war ended and Amman and the country stabilized uh, and Amman being Amman uh, being unified all these made the a new Amman come and uh, and, and, and a new uh, agreement with amendment with amendment to to the 1833 uh, uh, treaty was uh, came to appear 
يعني كما ذكرت انه بدات في 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 عام 1970 بعد ظهور النفط انه الشركات الامريكيه تضاعف نشاطها في عمان وبالذات في مجال النفط واستخراجه. So as I said 12 years later and that was 1970 where uh, oil fields been discovered uh, and exported in Oman and the American uh, business in oil oil business has bloomed in, in the area. نموذج من الـ 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 يعني احدى صفحات المعاهده باللغه العربيه So one of these is this is one of the page of this uh, treaty in Arabic واللغه الانجليزيه as well as in English تاريخ العلاقات الدبلوماسيه بشكل عام نمر عليهم ابرز القناصل الذين عينوا في الطرفين 1836 الولايات المتحده عينت احد رعاياها ويدعى ريتشارد بالمر ووترز ليكون اول قنصل امريكي في زنجبار So this is about the, the, the historical diplomatic relations between the two two countries, the United States of America appointed Mr. Richard Balmer Waters in 1836 as the his American's first Consul General to uh, Zanzibar. في مسقط عينت الحكومة الأمريكية مواطنا أمريكيا آخر يدعى هنري بي مارشال في 1838 تسلم عمله ثم انتقل إلى بومباي تعين محله رجل عماني كان مترجما للمعاهدة السابقة وهو سعيد بن خلفان. Uh, in Mascot, the United States of America appointed a U.S. citizen called Henry B. Marshall as a United States uh, Consul. That was in February 15, 1838. Uh, he started working in October, uh, mid-October 1838. After that, he moved to Bombay after th eight, uh, nine years. And actually, he's been replaced by uh, a, 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 an Oman citizen uh, after he died in 1845. Uh, في 1846 ألحقت مسقط بقنصلية زنجبار تسلم مهمها ريتشارد وارد القنصل الأمريكي في زنجبار في عهده برزت عدة خلافات على إثرها توقفت العلاقات بين الطرفين. The Alhaq been attached with the Zanzibar Consulate. Richard Ward became the U.S. Consulate in Zanzibar in 24 January 1846. During his time, there was these. Differences between the two countries, which ruined the relationships, and actually it has came. To the relations have come to a halt in July 1850. <laughs> بعد وفاة السيد سعيد في عهد السلطان التركي أخذ الاهتمام الأمريكي بالمنطقة يتجدد ووافقت واشنطن على تعيين لويس ماغوايرمان من مؤسسة مصر التابعة لمؤشركة تاول وهو شخص بريطاني مقيم قنصلا لأمريكا استقبل رسميا في 22 يوليو 1808 But the, again and these differences has been uh, resolved and settled and Mr. William McMillan became uh, the, the deputy uh, consul for the Zanzibar in 1852, Macmillan uh, been appointed as the official consul for the United States in Zanzibar. And actually, being these U.S. consuls started to come uh, one after another after, uh, for this position. During the Turkey bin Said Sultan, the American actually show more interest in the area, uh, and especially this was after the United States Civil War. And Washington agreed to appoint Louis Maguire uh, 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 to represent the, the towel and uh, Association company, and he was a British person to be the U.S. Uh, consul, and he was officially received in uh, July 22, 1880. Naam. المقنصلية الأمريكية في مسقط وأرسلت أوراقها ووثائقها إلى بغداد 1915 لم يكن هناك حضور دبلوماسي في عمان عندما تولى صاحب الجلالة حتى تأسيس أو إنشاء السفارة 1972. In October 1886, Macardi and he's also from Tall Company and Associates. Um, he, he, received, he became the consul, American consul, and actually, this uh, choosing non-American citizens to be to be uh, U.S. Uh, consuls in, in in Muscat has been continued until uh, until the trade started to bloom again, 
and then uh, the American uh, closed their uh, consulate in Muscat and sent uh, all of these, the archives and everything to Baghdad. Uh, and there was an, a, a diplomatic uh, prison, uh, of US diplomatic prison in Amman when uh, Sultan was, took the opportunity in 1970. أنا خلصت أنا خلصت بس آخر وثيق أن أن اللي هي تأسيس ال السفارة ال السفارة 1972 افتتاح السفارة الأمريكية في مسقط أول سفير ويليام ستولتس فور وأول سفير عماني كان افتتحت السفارة في عام 73 وكان السيد فيصل بن علي أول سفير في ما بين 73 إلى 74. Last not least about opening the U.S. embassy. In Muscat, uh, the ambassador William A. Uh, Saltvisit was uh, the first uh, American embassy. Uh, he was a delegate in Kuwait before that. Uh, he, he gave his papers to Sultan Qaboos as the U.S. Uh, non-resident uh, diplomacy uh, ambassador. خلاص خلاص بس كان في يعني بعض زيارات المتبادلة بين الطرفين وغيرهم. ما أريد أن أقوله في هذا الموضوع في كتاب جدا مهم. مؤلف اسمه هيرمان فريدريك إيلتس هيرمان فريدريك إيلتس هذا من أبرز وأفضل من كتب عن تاريخ العلاقات وبالتحديد عن رحلة السفيرة سلطانة فيها تفاصيل كثيرة جميلة عن السفيرة وكيف وصلت ويعني قصة وصول السفيرة وصفها وهو كتاب جدا يعني أنصح في قراءة. So I would like you to to read about the the history and relations between the two countries. And one of the books that I advise you to read is about written by Herman Friedrich Ellis about the Ahmed bin Oman mission to the United States and about the 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 ship that visited the United States. I encourage you all to read this book and also reading about the U.S. and Omani relationships. Thank you. شكرا لكم وعذرا للإطار. Thank you. Thank you. شكرا دكتور محمد <تصفيق> نأتي الآن إلى الورقة الثانية في هذه الجلسة للدكتور لين فرحو ميهرز أستاذ التاريخ ومدير مركز دراسات الشرق الأوسط بجامعة ولاية جورجيا في أتلانتا لديه العديد من المنشورات لديه العديد من الكتب خاصة ما يتعلق بسلطنة عمان وأيضا امتدادات سلطنة عمان التاريخية والجغرافية إلى شرق أفريقيا ولديه أيضا كتاب حول ابن خلدون ولديه الكثير من التحليلات والقراءات لأننا كعمانيين نتحدث اللغة الإنجليزية We are the Omanis, we speak English well so, there is no need for translating, I think. So we need Master uh, Ellen speak directly and quickly and fastly. Okay, 120 miles per hour. Yes, okay. But show us what you have. Thank you. We welcome Mr. Ellen, please. Hello, thank you, Ashkorukum, yes, and thank you to the ambassador, the Safir, and to Sultan Qaboos Cultural Center, especially uh, Ridolfo and Janan, uh, Kathleen Ridolfo, and Abir, and all the new people I've met here this year. Thank you. So I just want to uh, do a quick summary, a quick run through here, um, and focus on some new material. Uh, that the, the last presenter, El Ramey, and I want to thank my previous presenter, uh, spoke about the book by Elts, uh, which is very famous indeed, and I have used some of that material myself, but I've also found some new documents um, about the impact of the Sultana and its voyage to the United States more broadly, the cultural impact of the Kafa, right? Lesa hunak fakat al siyasa, hunaka the Kafa, I done, okay? So uh, we've already talked about Hassan bin Nu'man and Sayyid Said bin Sultan and their connection right, uh, to 
these Americans, Edmund Roberts and Martin Van Buren, he was the eighth president of the United States. And he was the president when the Sultana in 1840 arrived, this remarkable moment uh, in New York. It was really a change in American cultural history. Right? This was the first time you had an Arab diplomat coming to the United States. Right? And it caused a sensation more widely within New York, within the culture, within people's perceptions of who the Arabs are. Right? Uh, many people had a perception a little bit from uh, uh, Muhammad Ali of Egypt. They didn't know very much about uh, Sultan uh, and Oman. But this opened the door to that uh, new cultural awareness. So the one document that we have showing the actual Sultana ship is from the uh, Illustrated London News. This is the only actual historical representation of the Sultana. So I thought it was very interesting to see this. This is from its landing on, on its voyage back to the Queen. The Sultana, uh, it actually looks like a Western ship in many respects. And it shows that the Omanis had mastered in their shipbuilding uh, cities, which they used both Bombay, but also uh, in Oman as well. They had mastered this art of building uh, these uh, these uh, highly technologically advanced ships. Um, this is the Peacock. This is the ship that Edmund Roberts actually s used. It was a sloop of war. Um, I can just hold it. Yeah. <laughs> cool ship. Okay. This is the sloop of war that actually fought in the uh, War of 1812. And this is a global connection here that we need to make with this embassy between the United States and Oman. It's in the context of rivalry between the United States and Britain, right? So the Sultan saw the United States as an alternative to British domination. In the same way, the United States saw Oman as an alternative to British supremacy within the Indian Ocean, right? So it was a strategic relationship. It wasn't just a relationship of, of happenstance or of, of a random encounter. It was very much a strategic relationship. And the amount of American goods flowing into East Africa was extraordinary at this time through Zanzibar. In fact, the cloth that was used by almost every person in Africa at the time was called Merkani, or American cloth, and they would drape it over themselves. People from poor to rich would wear the Merkani cotton, right? Cotton, of course, coming from South, which is where I'm from, Atlanta, right? <laughs> So this uh, USS Peacock Sloop of War, it's connected to that wider history. These are some of the actual gifts and articles of trade that were sent on the Sultana in 1840. We have consumables, cloves, we have copal, hides, the Persian carpets mentioned, and most important of all, the symbolic importance of these gifts that were given by the Sultan to the president personally to the person of the president, Martin Van Buren. Okay, here's, an, here's the actual silk carpet that is in the Smithsonian Museum today, right? It is not often on display. Sometimes it is. If you see it that it's on display, please go and look. Right? But this is the actual catalog number for the silk carpet that was given to Martin Van Buren. It ended up in the museum due to a big convoluted story, which I will try to discuss briefly. These are representation of the types of American articles that would have been sent back on the Sultana, back to Zanzibar. Because this voyage back was almost as important as this voyage to the United States, right? It was something of a commercial success, but really diplomatic success as well. This is an example of the type of revolver, the Colt revolver, that Sayyid Said bin Sultan was very interested in obtaining. And in fact, it etched his name personally, right? This is a gift from the people of the United States to uh, Sayyid Said bin Sultan. These shoes are really interesting. In fact, the third mate, so the, the third in line on the ship Sultana, wore these shoes to the United States because there were already shoes from the United States being traded before the Sultana came. So um, a lot of shoes went on the ship back as well. <laughs> Okay, mirrors, the largest mirrors possible. Mirrors were hard to obtain uh, in Oman at the time. That was a special object uh, that was given particularly 
to the Sultan. It's also, I think, important to note that the 1833 treaty is uh, connected to a dramatic incident that happened uh, on Masira Island in 1835, right? And a dramatic rescue that was instigated by Sayyid, Sayyid bin Sultan that I think is symbolic of the relationship between Oman and the United States today. That Oman is a force of security, it is, a, it is of peace and of rescue for, uh, for ships going through the Gulf of Oman and through the Strait of Hormuz. The, oh, the peacock on its way to Muscat was attacked by some pirates. It got into trouble near Masira Island and the Sultan personally sent his, uh, the Sultana ship to rescue the peacock, right? So this ship that came to New York, it's symbolic of that rescue of American sailors, that saving of American lives um, that occurred in 1835. And it was something that was uh, something of a fascination in the press as well. So things got off to a very good start in terms of the relationship between Oman uh, and the United States. In fact, the Evening Post said there's not a monarch in Christendom whose character would not have been elevated in the eyes of the world by conduct like this. So his character is even better than that of the monarchs of Christendom, of Christianity. And Sayyid Said said of the Treaty of 1833, this shall be faithfully observed as long as the world endures. So hopefully our world endures long because that's how long the relationship between Oman and the United States will be. <laughs> Okay, uh, Masira Island and Zanzibar. So the real focus of this trade and this exchange, of course, is through the very rich markets of Zanzibar. And I've written quite a, a, a lot about Sayyid Said bin Sultan in Zanzibar. But I wanted to emphasize just how cosmopolitan and vibrant a place this island was in the 1830s and 40s. Here's another example from the Illustrated London News just showing the different outfits or costumes of the, of the whole melange of people uh, that converged on this island and traded on this island. And how important it was that the United States suddenly had uh, free trade access uh, to Zanzibar. Okay. Um, so among the articles on the Sultana were these two very valuable Omani horses. Okay. Omani horses are still the pride of Oman today in the stables uh, of the Sultan. The problem was that the president, Martin Van Buren, could not accept them personally, right? Because of the moments clause. We know about this because of the last president, yes? You cannot actually take very valuable gifts because it's constitutionally not allowed. Hassan bin Na'aman was a very astute diplomat. And he knew, in fact, that Martin Van Buren was in this pickle, was in this problem. So what he did is he said, I will recharacterize the gifts. They will be recharacterized as gifts to the people of the United States. Oh, yeah. To the Sha'ab, Amrikiya. Yeah. Yes? Because he knew his mission was to give the gifts. If he didn't give the gifts, he would be in trouble with the sultans, right? And also Martin Van Buren wanted some way to accept the gifts. But before we get into that, I wanted to say that the impacts of the Sultana mission haven't been fully explored more locally. The Board of Aldermen of New York City were so astounded by this ship coming in, they passed a resolution saying we need to have people follow them around and help them get from place to place throughout New York. They had a welcoming party from the City Council of New York. Um, and it created a, a major social impact uh, within the United States, okay? I talked about the constitutional impact. It clarified this clause of emoluments. It allowed the Congress to debate, well, how do we accept uh, gifts uh, from, from other countries or personal gifts uh, to the Sultan? Here's, in fact, um, a message to Congress from Martin Van Buren. And I think this also explains one of the open questions about this mission is why didn't Hassan bin Amman actually visit Martin Van Buren personally, right? Why wasn't he welcomed to the White House, right? He stayed within New York, really, for the most part. He was welcomed to the naval yards and all these other things. I think it was a political calculation by Martin Van Buren because he was in his election year. 
and he did not want to be portrayed as accepting gifts from foreign governments or to be painted uh, in that way by his rivals of the Whigs. So politics gets mixed with diplomacy as well, even in the 1830s. But it gave him a chance to say, well, we, we, we don't actually, we can't, I can't accept these personally, but I want to give them as a gift uh, to the people of the United States. Okay, and here he is actually speaking to uh, Sayyid Said bin Sultan um, and discussing how wonderful this is, but I have to decline the gift as a paramount duty to my country. But I want to say that this is a great kindness uh, to us. Okay, um, so the Sultana was a great popular media sensation. And all of you, most of you here deal with the press, right? Imagine how you would cover the arrival of a ship from a culture, from a nation that had never arrived on your shores before, right? Some of the high press, right, did it well, and they explained some of the cultural context as well as they could. Some of the lower press did not do as well, perhaps. Uh, there were two English women that were on the ship they thought that these English women were actually the concubines of the ambassador. <laughs> they were not, <laughs> right? Um, they were these Orientalist uh, projections that were made on the Sultana. But at the same time, in the, in the higher press, there was this appreciation of the Sultana as, an, as America coming to the world, right? And as America stepping into the world as an independent force after the War of 1812. And in fact, it became a subject of children's magazines, right? So we have here an article from Parley's Magazine for Children talking about Muscat as this uh, wonderful uh, port and as the place where the Sultana came from that everybody knows now. Um, and in the fine arts music, uh, magazines. It says, let the gallant ship go home repaired and equipped in a style worthy of American workmanship and American gratitude. So the American workmen actually rebuilt the ship and created a pleasure barge for Sayyid Zayed bin Sultan. One thing that Sayyid Zayed bin Sultan was very interested in was steamship technology, right? Because he knew that the British were going to excel beyond him with the steamship technology. And the British deliberately kept that technology from him. So he thought maybe the Americans could provide that as a way around the previous uh, system. So technology was already um, a part of the equation. Here's the actual Treaty of Amity and Commerce. And with this in mind, and I urge you to read it sometime on your own, <laughs> right? Because we can't go through every single article here. Um, I want to just summarize that the Sultana voyage and the Treaty of 1833 were about trade, but they were also about much more than trade. It was a triumph of public diplomacy, whether deliberate or not. It, it changed America's views of the Arab world and put Oman on the map for Americans. Um, Article 5, which is based on this Masira incident, Oman continues to rescue American citizens in distress. Oman personally, the Sultan Qaboos, uh, personally spent money to rescue hikers in Iran and, and extract them from that country, right? Um, and Oman is a security partner and a stabilizing force in the region still to this day, as it was when the peacock uh, was attacked near Masira. Um, the spirit of the 1833 treaty has remained through all these changes that have been discussed before um, and up to 1972 when the diplomatic relations were formally established and up to the 2009 free trade agreement which will be discussed later this afternoon as well. So as the Muscat Daily's article here and as many of your articles and wonderful reporting have shown there is still this legacy of Oman and US free trade that is established on this 1833 agreement, but is also a cultural phenomenon. It is also uh, a, a reflection of public diplomacy and also shows, I think, a, a wonder, a, an important role for Oman in shaping the American views and maybe even disputing some common American misconceptions 
um, about the Arab world. And so I just want to thank you and thank you and thanks the Sultan Qaboos Cultural Center for what it does uh, in that regard as a very strong uh, force in dialogue uh, between the American people and the Omani people as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Alan. Thank you, uh, Professor Muhammad. Our first season session actually is finished. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Saad al-Safir Musa al-Ta'i, Safir Sultanat Oman fi al-Wilayat al-Muttahida al-Amerikiya. Dr. Muhammad Mubarak al-Arimi, Raiz Jamiyat al-Sahafiyyin al-Omaniya, al-Zumala al-Kiram, Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. طبعا هي سعادة كبيرة أن نتواجد هنا في واشنطن العاصمة لنقل بعض الصور عن سلطنة عمان ثقافة وإنسانا وحضارة وهذه الجلسات وهذه وهذا الملتقى يعبر حقيقة عن عن رغبة العمانيين الدائمة لنشر ثقافتهم وأن يكونوا دائما رسل للسلام في كل مكان حرصا على الوقت سنرحب بالأساتذة الذين سيشاركون في الجلسة الثانية الدكتور زكريا المحرمي فليتفضل الدكتور جي آي بيترسون الدكتور جي آي بيترسون والدكتور عبيد الشخصي طبعا هذه الجلسة اللي هي الجلسة الثانية ستكون تحت عنوان عمان عام الاستقرار في الخليج العربي تحت هذا العنوان هناك ثلاث أوراق عمل سيقدمها الأساتذة الأفاضل من خلال الوقت المتاح لهذه الجلسة أذكر بأن هذه الجلسة مدتها تقريبا 75 دقيقة 75 دقيقة هو الوقت المتاح لهذه الجلسة وبما أن ثلاثة الأساتذة متواجدين سيكون تقسيم يعني بالتساوي 25 دقيقة لكل ورقة عمل يعني قد يكون هذا الوقت ليس طويلا ولكنه إن شاء الله نحاول أيضا وأنتم تحاولوا أنكم تستغلوه بالقدر الذي يسمح بإيصال المعلومة والهدف من هذه الورقة Your Excellency Mr. Ambassador Head of the Association of Journalists Dear distinguished guests I'd like to welcome you all again This is a great forum for us This is where we uh, uh, Omanists want to spread our and talk about and raise awareness about our uh, um, our culture. Uh, the, our second panel today is uh, about Oman, a stability factor in the Arab Gulf. Uh, we have three panelists: uh, Dr. Zakaria, J. Peterson, and Mr. Obed. They have 75 minutes in this. Uh, each of them uh, equally 25 minutes. Thank you. ورقة العمل الأولى سيقدمها الدكتور زكريا المحرمي بعنوان المواطنة العالمية نهج عماني الدكتور زكريا المحرمي هو كاتب عماني وطبيب مختص في الأحياء الدقيقة السريرية تخرج من جامعة السلطان قابوس في عام 1999 بشهادتي بكالوريوس علوم صحية ودكتور في الطب أمدي وفي عام 2008 حصل على شهادة الزمالة من الكلية الملكية لعلوم الأمراض بلندن وله أكثر من ثلاثين مقالا طبيا في الدوريات المحكمة ابتداء من الكتابة في مجالات الثقافة والفكر عام 2004 طبعا يعني السيرة المكتوبة عن الدكتور زكريا هي طويلة ولكن نحن يعني استثمارا للوقت لمن أراد أن يرجع إلى الكتيب المصاحب تفضل الدكتور زكريا المحرمي وعنوان الورقة المواطنة العالمية نهج عماني He says uh, you can find about Dr. Zakaria Al-Mamari uh, profile on page 30 as well as 
on Dr. Ubaid al Shaksi on page number 31. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum jami'an. I think today يعني, I would uh, give this speech in Arabic first and then translation in English. I would translate it myself. Uh, probably there are some terminologies I might be يعني, not fully successful in translating them, but I'll try my best. Uh, my paper was supposed to be something about uh, Oman and globalization, but I thought, uh, and this idea actually in my mind since long time, is to talk about Omani solutions for global uh, crisis. Uh, I'll start. Uh, you want me to? S okay. I will. Because the presentation in Arabic, so people who are Arabic speaking only can read the slides and I will translate in English. I will be covering uh, the concept of uh, uh, multiculturalism and the, the major challenges uh, facing humanity today and uh, about the major causes of the global crisis, uh, the concept of uh, a state uh, about the uh, historical uh, Omani nation uh, or Omani state, and then I will talk about the Omani solution for the global crisis. In 1971, uh, the Canadian government, uh, they have adopted uh, a concept called uh, multiculturalism. It seems after the visit of Charles de Gaulle to Quebec, there was some flaring between uh, the French Canadian and the British Canadian. So uh, the thinkers there, they thought about how to combine these two and uh, the nation should be in harmony. So they, br they brought this concept of multiculturalism. They actually they invented the concept, even though people were multicultural uh, everywhere. And that was just to uh, yani, probably to consolidate the concept of tolerance uh, between the uh, different uh, composition of the Canadian society. Uh, in 1996, the United Nations have adopted the tolerance concept as uh, one of its merits. And in 2002, after the 9-11, uh, events here in the U.S., the United Nations have also adopted a new concept. They called it uh, cultural diversity. And there is a day for cultural diversity, I think, every May of each year. Unfortunately, this concept of multiculturalism, even though it was criticized by many liberal philosophers, because according to them that it gives power to the minorities and then the concept of uh, equalization is lost. Uh, that is aside, unfortunately there is a failure of uh, multiculturalism, what we can see now because of the, right of, the rise of uh, uh, the far rights in uh, yeah, I mean, probably here in the US and Europe and the, uh, the, the issue of uh, the nationalism in India and in, uh, even in some Arab states. Uh, and you could see what is happening now in Ukraine, uh, where one power would like to enforce itself on other nation, uh, not recognizing the, uh, their independence and their rights to join whatever uh, yani, other, uh, what do you call, yani, tahalufat, uh, alliances. Uh, there are actually major crises we are facing as human beings. Uh, probably the most important is the climate change and uh, the wars that is now happening here and there, and also the rise of uh, the religious uh, fanatism and uh, also the, the racial and 
the sexism and uh, inequality in, in distribution of wealth, uh, either in the local communities or worldwide. And if we look in depth at the root causes of this uh, global crisis, uh, even though we all recognize that this shouldn't happen, and we should treat uh, each other as human beings with respect and dignity. Unfortunately, uh, there is weakness in our commitment to our uh, moral obligation. And also there is this controversy about uh, our realization of uh, our obliga of this obligation and between our response and uh, our action. And to me, that goes back mainly to two simple reasons. One is this poor uh, moral commitment of what we should do or what, uh, what should happen. And the other one is we always are biased towards our own agendas and our own uh, benefits, either uh, our selfish or our group uh, uh, agendas against the human and global uh, agendas. Uh, by the way, what is the best uh, translation of masalah that year? Interest. Interest, yes. Okay, good, thank you. Because we are biased to our own uh, self interest, it's uh, th this bias is, according to Hegel, the uh, German philosopher, is due to what he calls is the liberty that of the low level, liberty. And according to him, the full or the absolute liberty is linked to the state, where he says the law, uh, the morality, uh, or the objective morality and the government are the only real thing or, or the positive reality that completes the uh, liberty. And the state, according to Hegel, is uh, the moral life. And it, is, uh, it exists. And when it, is, when, when it exists, so that is the state, it's the, the moral uh, existence. And the, the, the state is the only will or the complete will when, when it is in, comp uh, when there is, yeah, when, when the, uh, the will of the person and the will of the state are the same. So the, w that is where the, the, the liberty comes. And then he concludes that the, the people or the nation that it should alert us uh, in, in history are those who had a state. And it should be understood that the state is the complete uh, simplification or existence of the liberty. So from what Hegel says, when he talks about the, the nation that had a state, this, these are the, the, the moral existence and these are uh, the, the, the best representation of liberty, we come to uh, a French uh, document which has been sent by the revolutionary government in uh, 1796 to their consulate in Basra to uh, a person who was supposed to be the uh, French consular to Masqat. And they addressed the Omani people as the, uh, the eldest uh, nation in the world. And why did they say that? Because actually Herodot, when he talked about the origin of the world, he, talk, he, he, he talks about uh, the Phoenix or the Phoenicians who came from the uh, uh, from the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula 
And according to Herodot, one of the princess in uh, uh, the Greek princess, she loved one of these Phoenician and she f flee uh, the island with him. So the Greeks, they made an army to invade the east and that is the start of the war. So the Umanis, they were the cause of the start of history. And if, if you see, if you look at uh, this uh, map, this shows actually the Portuguese empire. And we had the concept that the Portuguese have conquered Oman. Actually, you can see from here that they have occupied only a few ports in Oman. They did not invade the whole country. The whole country was, was still run by Oman. And this is very important. Omani nation is probably the only nation in the world that has not been occupied. And this is very important. It goes back to what the Eagle was talking about, the morality. The Omanis, they kept their uh, morals and uh, their uh, social uh, traditions from thousands of years till today unchanged. If you look at all nations, if you talk about US, English came, they wiped, they bored, they have Britain, uh, in, in, in new culture. Uh, if you go to England, the Vikings and uh, Irish and whatever, it's only Oman is, is the country that has kept and saved it tra its uh, tradition. And this is very important when we talk about things later. So we can say that uh, Oman is, is a moral being. And uh, the Omani citizen or the Omani person is, an, um, is also a moral being. And actually, uh, his, uh, the Prophet uh, Muhammad, when he talked about, this is 1,400 years ago, and before the Omanis became Muslims, uh, there was one guy who came complaining that one tribe has beaten him and he ran away from them, yani breathing for his life. And they told him, if you went to the Omanis, they will never curse you and they will never beat you. And that is what is known about Oman yani in history, that they are very moral, uh, observant, observant people. So now I will talk about Omani solution for, um, uh, for the global crisis. The, the first and the major crisis is uh, global warming. Oman, for one reason or another, is the only country that harbors opulent mountains. And opulates have been found that it can absorb free carbon and it, bind it binds it to magnesium and coal, uh, it, it crystallizes. Mm -hmm. So now I think there are a group from NASA is studying the Omani mountains and they are thinking how can we fasten this process so that we can clean the global air from, uh, from the carbon and this issue of global warming will go off. And actually I was yani, advising some people in the government that, well, why don't you take some of these stones, make them, make them like marble, and give them like gifts for the United Nations building at least, so that it also absorbs the free carbon and it helps in global warming. When we, when we look at the, uh, the political system, of Oman. It is very unique in history and also nowadays. It is based on two major concepts. One which I call the uh, Shura al hukama or the, uh, the Shura of the wise people. Uh, the current, they'll talk about the current situation. You have the Senate and the House in the, in the state. Both, be, uh, both uh, branches are being elected by the people. In Oman, we have 
also two branches. But one, we call it the Shura Council, which is elected by, by, by the people. And the other one is the State Council. It is actually selected by His Majesty the Sultan. And those people who are like uh, Mr. Hatim here, these are the people uh, who are the talented people. They are either uh, specialized uh, in medicine, or in engineering, or in security, or in judiciary, or in economics, finance, or in politics. Uh, so, and this is uh, just to equalize, because now with the rise of uh, uh, populism, where people and the politicians are being uh, dragged and directed by the, uh, yani probably the, the uh, what do you call yani the, what the people uh, like. Uh, here in Oman, it is the wise people that guides the, the politics and uh, that guides uh, the decision making. The second concept uh, is the respect to other nation and the non-interference uh, in their uh, own affairs. And this has been addressed many times by His Majesty uh, Sultan Qaboos and also His Majesty Sultan Haytham. Also, the, what, what, what is there in Oman is we, have, we are lucky that we are, most of the time, we have visionary leadership, like His Majesty Sultan, uh, who have decided that he, he made what is called like academic chairs in different universities, and he built uh, uh, cultural centers like this one. And uh, also he, he asked, actually asked uh, to, uh, to publish a periodical called Tolerance, 2003, and it's still continuing, but they changed the title to at the farm. Uh, I don't know what is the understanding. And the understanding, probably, it's called. <coughs> also, another thing uh, very special about Oman, not found in any other place, is that the Omanis, they have invented their own Islamic school. It is historically known as the uh, Ibadism, but probably some people, they question that uh, description. But what is special about this Islamic school, it considers all other Muslims are the same. So they, they can marry from the Ibadis, and the Ibadis can marry from them. And it is not allowed for any Muslim to uh, to attack or to uh, even say bad things about the other Muslim. In other Islamic schools, this is not very clear as in the Omani school. In, in some schools, they don't allow you to marry from other schools, okay? But the Omanis, this is very clear. And this is why all Omanis, whether they are Ibadis or non Ibadis, they feel they are equal and they feel the country represents them and represents their interest and they excel in, in, in working in it. And there was an article in The Economist in 2018 and uh, they described the Ibadis as very tolerant, uh, not only to Muslims, but also to Christians and uh, to the Jews. So, yani in conclusion, Oman is to me as a moral state. Uh, the uh, Oman Mountains uh, is probably a solution for the uh, global warming. Uh, the Shura of uh, the wise uh, is probably the best political system and it's a solution for uh, many uh, political problems uh, facing many governments, and uh, the, the Islamic school or the religious school that adopts uh, 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 polarism, 
for arrest is the guarantee for the harmonization of the community and the divisionary leadership is the one that uh, conserves the, the moral or the direct, the, the moral compass of any community. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, sorry if I was confusing in my uh, English presentation. Thank you. شكرا للدكتور زكريا المحرمي وانبهك بانك ما كملت الوقت الورقه الثانيه سيقدمها لنا الدكتور جي اي بيترسون وهي بعنوان العلاقات العمانيه الامريكيه في عهد السلطان قابوس بن سعيد الدكتور جي اي بيترسون مؤرخ ومحلل سياسي متخصص في شبه الجزيرة العربية والخليج ومقره في توكسون أريزونا بالولايات المتحدة الأمريكية قام بالتدريس في جامعات مختلفة في الولايات المتحدة وفرنسا وارتبط بعدد من معاهد البحث الرائدة في الولايات المتحدة والمملكة المتحدة حتى عام 1999 عمل في مكتب نائب رئيس الوزراء للأمن والدفاع في مسقط بسلطنة عمان وهو منتسب إلى مركز دراسات الشرق الأوسط بجامعة أيريزونا الآن مع ورقة العمل الثانية مع الدكتور جي أي بيترسون وهي بعنوان العلاقات العمانية الأمريكية في عهد السلطان قابوس بن سعيد Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm very happy that the Omani Journalist Association has taken this opportunity to help uh, cement further Omani-American relations. Um, I am grateful to have had maybe nearly half a century of association with Oman in many different respects and to see the, the deepening of relations between these two countries. And I'm also happy that uh, the Sultan Qaboos Cultural Center has been doing such a wonderful job and other organizations such as the National Council on U.S.-Arab Relations. And I see there's a going to be a great future for relations. Um, well, that basically sums up what I have to say, so thank you. No, no, actually, <laughs> there is more. Um, I'm moving f a little forward in time than uh, the earlier panel, so basically it's this last 50 years or so of us omani relations that I wish to consider. Um, we've already talked uh, on the early relations in the 19th century, um, and there's actually been discussion of the early uh, the 20th century before 1970 um, with the U.S. consulate in uh, Muscat, 1880 to 1915, um, one that was primarily devoted to trade uh, with the import of the export to the United States of dates, um, including one of the major U.S. companies involved in that was Hills Brothers, which is probably known more to Americans as uh, dealing in coffee. <coughs> After that time, um, relations really languished. Uh, even the treaty in 1958 was a request by Sultan Saeed to update that 1833 treaty because it didn't seem so relevant anymore. And it was not uh, actually, yes, there were two other little uh, connections, one of which was mentioned already. Uh, Sultan Saeed's world tour included uh, progress across the United States, including a stop in Hollywood that is specified because he liked movies. And apparently it was uh, a success because 25 years later he sent his son Kabuz on a world tour that Included crossing the United States and you can see Canada um, um, to give them a greater perspective on the world. But it wasn't until 1970, 1971 that relations began to reseat on a deeper and more lasting foundation. 
One factor in this, of course, was the accession of Sultan Qaboos to the throne and the complete change in, in the atmosphere of the country to development and interaction with the outside world. Almost simultaneously was British withdrawal from the Gulf. Um, Britain, of course, had a very long history with Oman and the other Gulf states. Um, many of the other Gulf states were not independent until this uh, British withdrawal, which was not the case with Oman, of course. But the question was, how were these states going to survive and how are they going to prosper as very small states in a vulnerable region? And therefore, the United States um, began to increase its representation and its presence in the region, including in Oman. Um, and uh, this photograph, uh, the building in the back was the first American embassy in this post-1970 period. Um, and as it grew and personnel grew, it um, expanded into the building in the foreground, which I believe was the original consulate of the, 19, of the 1880s and, and off. Unfortunately, neither of these uh, are still in existence. One of the pillars of that emerging relationship was in the area of development assistance. Oman, of course, had had far too little development before 1970, so various uh, American programs were introduced to help in those early years. Most of these were by the United States government, uh, but there was also a certain amount of private se American private sector assistance in um, as you can see, in a number of different areas, which lasted into the 1980s. So I'd like to take a few minutes to contrast what are American goals and concerns in this relationship and what I see as Omani goals and concerns. And to start with the American end, I've listed a number of security concerns the United States has had in the Gulf region stretching back three, four, maybe even five decades. And those are on the left. On the right is the ways in which the Sultanate of Oman has assisted the United States in um, protecting the region and uh, facilitating uh, American endeavors. Um, formally, this began with the facilities agreement in 1980, which has been renewed a number of times, and the last in 2019, a, a new framework for um, American presence in the Gulf and Oman. And then I've listed a number of ways, specific ways, in which Oman has assisted the United States in these security concerns. And I draw your attention to the bottom, Omani intermediation with third parties, specifically Iran and the, uh, American, the Omani role in the rescue of American citizens held in Iran. And more recently in the Yemeni war, Oman's intercession with the Houthis once again to release American citizens. Uh, very important roles that sometimes are not not considered as, as fully as they should be. So what does Oman want out of this relationship? Well, I would suggest obviously the first uh, and primary goal is to keep a strong and cordial relationship, productive bilateral relations, uh, concern and coordination across an entire number of issues. Um, Oman's role in the GCC is important both to Oman and the United States. Commercial relations are another important factor. Beginning well before the free trade agreement, but that certainly was a milestone in, in cementing these economic and commercial relations. Um, 
the trade uh, statistics I have, they're a little bit dated, but they show that that trade relationship goes both ways. And even though these amounts of money are fairly small in the United States context, as you can see, Oman uh, enjoy, I should say, the United States is Oman's fourth largest trading partner, and this, these, the amount of trade is growing as we speak. There are many other aspects, education, cultural matters. Um, I, my source of 2017 for 2,800 Omani students, I'm sure that many people in this room will correct me uh, as to a much later figure. And very importantly, Oman has strategic concerns, obviously. And I've just gone through and, and uh, marked a number of places where hostilities um, and actual combat have occurred in the region. It is a very volatile neighborhood. Oman is in some ways in the center of it. And if you look in the center of the map, Oman spe bears special responsibility for the Strait of Hormuz which is an international strait, but I'll remind you that the traffic ways both into and out of the Gulf are within Omani territorial waters. And this can be fraught with danger, and during the Iran-Iraq War, Oman nearly came to blows with Iran to preserve its, its territorial waters. Um, that situation has changed, but there are others that have come about. <clears throat> So, certainly Oman desires strategic cooperation with the United States. Um, much of this is in the military sphere with joint exercises, arms purchases, etc. Um, and there is comfort, I think, in a strategic umbrella that the United States uh, exerts in the Gulf region and over the Sultanate of Oman. So where are we today? Well, as I have, everyone has mentioned here, the strong cordial relations between the two countries, uh, regional security cooperation, um, mention I think should be made of a recognition of the continued British role on Oman. Um, Britain is sometimes called Oman's oldest friend and obviously had a very strong presence in the region until fairly recently, but Oman's connection with Britain remains very strong, and the American connection with Oman does not conflict with that, but they reinforce each other. No partnership is totally in harmony, and there have been differences between the United States and Oman. Um, I point out oh, Iran and the, the sort of current climate in this country that has been expressed in um, opposition to a renewal of the JCPOA. Um, it should be remembered that Oman provided the meeting place as well as some of the initial impetus to the connections between Iran and the United States, and that Omani connection to Iran was never broken from the days of the revolution on. Its relations have been at least correct, sometimes more economic relations have been good, and, the United, and Oman has provided good uh, channel of communications and channel of contact between the two countries. Similarly, there have been some differences over Yemen. Very recently, of course, there's been a clamoring amongst some parties in the United States over re-insertion uh, of the terrorist designation for the Houthis in Yemen, which opposition to that has been mainly on grounds of humanitarian aid would not get to people of Yemen. But there's an even more important not just as important, I should say, There's, is the consideration that 
the Houthis are there to stay. They occupy some of the most important, important parts of the country. They will not be dislodged by war. And the only way to end this war is the recognition that the Houthis are a major part of any post-combat agreement of ceasefire, part of the reconstruction of a government in Yemen. And here I think that Oman can play a very strong and helpful role. They've already established links and communications with the Houthis, as well as other parties in Yemen. And in terms of Omani-U.S. relations, it would be beneficial to everyone concerned if the United States would use those connections the Omanis have with the Houthis in order to create a more balanced uh, set of negotiations for a peaceful resolution to a terrible combat. Um, and as the future goes, American Omani relationship, as I started out, is looking good. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. Shukran to Dr. J. A. Peterson. وكانت ورقة العمل التي قدمها عن العلاقات العمانية الأمريكية في عهد السلطان قابوس بن سعيد الآن مع الورقة الثالثة الدكتور عبيد الشقسي وهي بعنوان صورة عمان في الصحافة الأمريكية الدكتور عبيد بن سعيد الشقسي حاصل على شهادة الدكتوراه في الاتصال الجماهيري من جامعة ويلز بالمملكة المتحدة والماجستير من جامعة ماركت بالولايات المتحدة الأمريكية والبكالوريوس في الصحافة والإعلام من جامعة السلطان قابوس عمل الدكتور عبيد محاضرا في جامعة السلطان قابوس وتقلد عدة مناصب أكاديمية وغير أكاديمية من بينها الرئيس التنفيذي لمركز التدريب الإعلامي وأمين عام اللجنة العمانية لحقوق الإنسان وعميد لكلية البيان الإعلامية الخاصة ورئيس لقسم الإعلام بجامعة السلطان قابوس ورقة العمل الثالثة في هذا المحور مع الدكتور عبيد الشقسي وبعنوان صورة عمان في الصحافة الأمريكية Not least on the uh, second panelist is uh, Dr. Obed uh, Al Shafsi. Uh, he earned his PhD degree in mass communication from the University of Wales in Cardiff in UK, United Kingdom, Masters from uh, Market University, Winkinson, United States of America, and Bachelor degree from uh, Sultan Qaboos University of Oman. The floor is yours. Sir. Being uh, the last speaker is sometimes a plus. So. Uh, <laughs> Everybody would have said it all, and my mission is only confined to hi and bye. <laughs> Your Excellency, the Ambassador, uh, Your Honor, Hatem, my colleagues, my friends, I'm very delighted actually to be before you today. I'd like to begin by thanking all of you, all of those who have contributed to make this event happen, especially the Omani Journalist Association, headed by Dr. Mohammed Aremi the Culture Center of Sultan Qaboos. And, well, I'd like to make a follow-up uh, to what my previous colleagues and friends have discussed about uh, the relationship between Oman and the United States. And we'll talk at this time, actually, about history, but from a different perspective, from the media and journalist perspective. And I relied heavily on first uh, sources, which is the original copies of the American newspaper that were published, published then, which did back, some of them actually did back uh, late 18th century. Uh, talk about the image, I decided to start my presentation with this lovely image. 
And for the new generation, they might not actually know what is exactly the meaning of the word queer before 1950, because it has... <laughs> I know you're going to laugh. <laughs> the word queer has a totally different meaning. It does not mean exactly the same thing as it was used today, or it is used today. It means something odd or strange. And I thought of pulling this one out, first of all. This lovely picture, actually, uh, was done by the uh, Seattle uh, Star. And it talks really positively about the traditional custom of Omani women. In, I think, if you read the text, because I read it all, uh, the, I, well, it has a, a, a PDF version. So uh, it means it, even the writers actually fell, fell in love with, the, with this lovely ladies. They was talk about their eyelashes, their almost naturally tanned color, and all of these things. But that, that is not the main point here. Um, my colleagues, they have already talked about the chronological timing of the relationship between Oman and the United States. Uh, they talked about uh, Boston Rambler and all of these things, and I don't want actually uh, to spend much time in giving uh, information, extra information in this respect. But all what I wanted to say is that the relationship actually is, is for over uh, 200 years. And this relationship, actually, I'm pulling right now like a very tentative hypothesis that will lead actually to the conclusion that I will come to at the end of my, the end of my presentation here. Since that the relationship is really very old, so Oman was not really a mysterious spot or a mysterious place to the Americans, nor was or America to the Omanis. And the assumption is that there should be like media reports on this relationship in the American newspaper. And because also of the relationship continued to be very uh, stable, very peaceful, very friendly, my hypothesis is that also the coverage of the American newspaper, even in the early days, will also be positive and favorable. I managed actually to go through uh, uh, different uh, documents or different newspapers um, based on the available reports that I was able to pull out from, from the Library of Congress, uh, New York Times, and other also newspapers. Um, the period that I studied almost from late 18th century till date. Um, my units of analysis were overall reports on Oman. It's like a very screening kind of study. The focus of analysis will be on subjects and the direction of reporting, whether it is or whether it was positive or negative or whatever. And the questions raised here is what are the subject area of reports about Oman and what are the direction of reports about Oman in the American media. Now, let's begin with this. The early report I was able really uh, to get hold of dates back to the 26th of November, 1798. And uh, this whole article was talking about the ship routes, especially in the Indian Ocean, in their way to Basra. In fact, the word Basra was written differently, like Basura. And the word mascot used F instead of merely typing uh, problems at that time. It's just to show you how old was that document. So mascot was on the American newspaper actually as early as 1798. So it is not something mysterious. It is something well known to the American journalists as well. Now the second one was coming from the Morning Herald, which was based in New York. And this particular article actually talked in full details about the arrival or the advent of the Sultan. In fact, this article by itself is a history. I have managed to download the whole article. It was very difficult. But it gives really minute details about how the ship was itself received by the Americans and how the American people themselves, just remember for us as Omanis, 
when we have white men actually coming to our villages at that time, we chase them. It is exactly the same thing that happened with the Omanis who were in the ship once they were under the state of New York. Even they yelled at them, Allah, 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 and that was written actually in this particular piece of uh, uh, article. Uh, the title of this article is Arrival of an Arabian Ship, Trade Between the United States and Moscow. In fact, looking at the wordings that were used at that time shows how favorable the reporting was about Oman and the arrival of that ship. I just leave it for maybe one minute to read it by yourself to see the wording. It's like more like a biblical, poetic language that we used to describe the arrival of that ship. And even they were very keen to use the Arabic pronunciation of the ship itself, Sultana. It's just like cultural attaché in, in, in the French way. So Sultana, okay, was written with double E with an astrophe actually on top. This shows how keen the newspaper was actually to give the right pronunciation of the ship itself. I don't want actually to go into much details about, I mean, the, uh, the shipment and the people because it has already been uh, given by my previous uh, colleagues. Now, I also wanted you to read uh, this extract from the article itself. We hail with pleasure the arrival of the Sultana. It is the commencement of an extensive trade between the Imam, sometimes called Imam, sometimes Imam with you, of Muscat and this country. It widens a profitable commercial channel. And also, I said, okay, why not, in order to find out the direction of the reporting, I pulled out, actually, uh, scripts from different newspapers that were published at that time, we're talking about early 19th century. And the scripts that you have on front of you on the screen is coming from two, three different newspapers to see, to, just to read uh, uh, about the image of Oman and the Sultan of Oman at that time as was published in the American newspaper. Here with Morning Hiller, it says Hi His Highness, referring to the Sultan Said bin Sultan at that time, is a remarkable man, as ambitious and as enterprising as Muhammad, Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali is a Turkish way of pronouncing the word Muhammad. It is because Turkey at that time also was Ottoman Empire, was well known actually to almost uh, different parts of the world. So they used Muhammad Ali of Egypt. He is in peaceful possession of an extensive, extensive country on the Indian Ocean and Persian Gulf. And in Africa, he hold the island of Zanzibar where the Sultana came. So this shows how positive was the reporting about the Sultan himself. And then we move into another newspaper, which was called the North Carolina. And this dates back to the 19th of September, 1840. Uh, in fact, there were many articles circulated around the newspapers themselves, as you might see. Here it says, the province of Oman, or Oman, is situated in the south southeastern part of the Arabia, or of Arabia. The coast extends along the Sea of Arabia from below Halhad. Halhad is Qalhad. Okay, there is also some typo mistakes here. And I managed actually just to put it as is, so to see exactly uh, uh, the text by itself. Uh, and, and it says that is governed by an imam, a spiritual chief, who is brave, intelligent, and exercises his power for the benefit of his people. His residence is in Muscat. He is called the Imam of Muscat. We go to, the, to another, actually, newspaper, which is called the Polynesian. Polynesian. This is from Hawaii, or Hama Hawaii. Hawaii, sorry. Ah. Hawaii. <laughs> Mixed with the telephone, sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, the static ship of four, okay, you go and read, you find that the reporting, the wordings were very uh, positive, and it held and praised the imam or the sultan and uh, the sultan at that time, and describing it as very peaceful and remarkable person. Now, 
I want also to raise a very important question here. As I was reading through different documents, I came actually with another sultana, which is a, the American sultana. I'm sure that many Americans know about the ship. It's a steamboat, it's not a sailboat. But unfortunately, this American sultana, unfortunately, did not last for long. It sank in the Mississippi River, it was exploded, maybe because of the oil overload. So the question raised here, I mean, is the American sultan named after the Omani sultana? Well, that is a question to be raised. And you can see from a historical point of view, the Omani sultana came before almost like, uh, 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 like 23 years ago, before the American sultana. Uh, so maybe they were fascinated by the word sultana and the thought of like building a steamboat, American steamboat actually using the name uh, Sultana. Um, I would like to leave more uh, time and space for discussion. Therefore, I will come into also the conclusion, which by itself can take also a, a number of minutes. Uh, the subjects and directions of reporting since late 18th century, I can easily categorize them in three different periods. The first period is from 1800 to 1900, in which the, most of the reportings in the American newspaper at that time were about the voyage of Sultana, trade, Muscat, Zanzibar, uh, Saeed bin Sultan, Imam, naval power. And in fact, uh, the direction also of the reporting at that time was very positive towards the Sultan and towards Oman. Here, Oman was seen as a strong Eastern power that possesses vast land, powerful military, lucrative trade and commercial venue, and brave leadership. Said bin Sultan was highly regarded and respected. Now, the second period was from 1900 to 1970, which is before uh, the, the Sultan of Qabus, the late Sultan of Qabus came to the throne. To, uh, um, most of the discussion or the reports were about culture and adventure. In fact, in 1935, there was a very uh, adventurous, uh, I would rather say, trip by Petram Thomas. And one of the American newspapers actually made a half page about that trip. And I can easily show it to you also later on on the screen, which was also there's lots of fascination about the Omani culture and the Arab culture and the Muslim culture at that time. OK, there was also about the austerity measures, especially during uh, Saeed bin Taymur's era, uh, tribal rebels, US military interest. And this was discussed, of course, that the interest of, the America, of America, the United States in Oman was for many reasons. One of them is for military security purposes, uh, partly due to uh, communism also, because the southern part of the peninsula, especially in Yemen, there was like uh, uh, the communists uh, were there, or communism was almost spreading uh, over that part of the, uh, of the peninsula. And also Sultan Faisal uh, bin Turki was also in the news. Sultan Saeed, historical visit uh, to the United States in 1938, and the arrest in Oman, uh, and the also British influence. These were the main subject area that were discussed in American newspaper at that time, or this, at that period. In general, the direction of the reporting was as follows. Oman continued to be respected and seen as an important strategic military point Many critical reports regarding the financial status and development were also observed at that time. The third period, which started from 1970 till date, um, in fact, there were extensive reports about the coup in Oman, especially by a reporter called Dan. Uh, I just want to remember the exact name. Um, many reports were talking about the coup in Oman was well, overthrown of the uh, Said bin Taymur and replacement uh, Sultan Qaboos, his son. 
Um, the unrest in the southern part of Oman, uh, the modernization of the country, uh, military relations with the United States, and Oman's role in world peace. Uh, most of the news, actually, or reports that were published in the American newspaper at that time focused in these major areas. Um, the direction also can be easily uh, summarized in that the late Sultan Qaboos was seen as a moderate, educated, and modernizing leader. He was highly respected, and the reports were less critical in reporting what was observed at that time, uh, less critical reporting or like offensive kind of reporting. Now, here we need to also find out the factors that were behind this positive portrayal of Oman. And I see these kind of uh, factors in the followings. One of them was Said bin Sultan himself, because he was seen as a brave leader. Um, he was also fascinated by himself in developing very good relationship with the Americans for reasons that were discussed and said by my colleagues. He was interested in finding uh, alternatives to the British, especially in time in terms of war. In fact, Roberts, who was mentioned by al Uremi, has made several attempts to convince Sayyid Saeed to make a treaty with the Americans. And the, one of the ways that he was used to convince him was giving him weapons as gifts. And the Sultan gets fascinated, fascinated with this gift, so he said, okay, that, this might actually open very good window to develop very good relationship with the Americans. Um, Sultan Qaboos bin Said himself was also another factor. Um, the strategic location of Oman, as mentioned by Jay uh, Roberts, the gateway Oman was gateway of, uh, to the Arabian uh, Gulf, uh, coastal areas, very wide, uh, very long coastal areas, um, that went with the American interest in the region, by the way, and also culture and people of Oman. Reports in Oman was not confined to a single paper. That's also another conclusion. Um, papers from different parts of the United States have published reports about Oman. So that is not only, f uh, I mean, these reports are not, not only coming from the uh, newspapers in, the, in, New York, in New York or in uh, Philadelphia or in Seattle or different places. They are coming from different parts of the United States. And that shows that the Americans and the American newspapers, per se, were also interested in getting or publishing news about Oman as early as uh, uh, like 1798. Um, here are some uh, footages that were published in the American newspapers. OK, this is also uh, Sultan Qaboos. And there are many things that I, that I would rather just stop here. And I thank you all for listening. I hope that I have not taken much of your time. شكرا دكتور عبيد ختاما لهذا المحور المحور الثاني نشكر الدكتور زكريا المحرمي طبعا قدم لنا الورقة بعنوان المواطنة العالمية نهج عماني والدكتور جي بيترسون ومحاضرته كانت عن العلاقات العمانية الأمريكية في عهد سلطان قابوس بن سعيد والدكتور عبيد الشخصي صورة عمان في الصحافة الأمريكية كان عنوان ورقة العمل شكرا لكم قبل أن نتجه إلى الاستراحة حقيقة أود أن أشكر سعادة السفير وكل أعضاء السفارة على استقبالهم الحار لنا رغم برودة الطقس شعرنا بالدفء في واشنطن بسبب ابتساماتكم واستقبالكم الطيب فتحية لكم وشكرا شكرا Another stage that was important is also the private radios private radios that came in later, uh, 2000 and so on. And uh, by now they are all doing very good job in promoting uh, the dialogue between uh, in the society and uh, discussing many important issues and 
what you can call probably hot topics. And Mr. Salem Al-Amri, who was with us, he is a, a GM of Al-Wisal. So these were important stations. And uh, we all focused in the last, again, 30 and 40 years, promoting professionalism in newspaper and uh, having uh, young graduates who are wor whether studied abroad or in uh, Sultan Qaboos University to work in the media. And that also was a very good uh, contribution to improve the skills and the newspaper themselves and focusing again on two important things, the objectivity of putting the news. So that, that was the brief of this history and uh, modern history of uh, media in Oman. And what we can see now is that Omani media probably, as you can tell, been always working very close with developments at Tanmiya. And uh, because you cannot have developments without a strong media, you need people and you need the citizen to be aware of what is happening in the country. You all know that Oman is relatively a bigger country and widely distributed the people from north to south to middle of Oman to the interior and so on. So the news or the media or the role of the media is to bring people together so that people understand what's happening in Musandam, what's happening in Muscat at capital, what kind of uh, decrees and rules are coming, and how does that affect them? That's the very important thing that the media can link the people or what is called the imagined community. So also I'd like to talk a little bit about the Omani politics and how it affected uh, the newspaper discourse. As you all know, Oman positions itself as a country of peace. And that affected uh, lots of things in the Omani culture and scene. And this was one of the visions of His, Ma late, Ma His Majesty, late Sultan Qaboos, when he once looked at the map and he, he said to an American journalist, I would like Oman to be friend with the whole countries, with every country we'd like to be friends. If they are different, uh, that's up to them. But in terms of foreign relations, it's very important uh, to have this uh, mission to be friends with all different uh, kind of countries. And uh, it was not an easy thing to achieve because, as you know, Oman is a relatively small country. But the wisdom of His Majesty and the leadership, we like to have good relation with Iran, good relation with the Saudis, good relation with China, good relation with uh, the US. So it's not always an easy mission in a region that you know full of tensions and wars and conflicts and problems. So Oman managed to keep this uh, neutral stand in its politics toward the world. And we like to be part of the solution, not part of the problems. This is the school of tradition that been in Oman for the last 50 years and probably before, since we have other scholars who talked about the history of Oman and Dr. Abed when he talked about, there was good reports about Oman in the American media in 1830 and 40 and so on. So we kept this tradition and we'd like to keep this tradition because we'd like to think of ourselves as people of peace and uh, harmony and solution, not problems. Uh, this affected our newspapers or the me newspaper discourse or themes. We always like to take neutral stand. As you know, they were always, and today as yesterday, as tomorrow, fights and conflicts everywhere. And it's very important that we keep uh, this stand uh, vivid and not to be engaged in fights and conflicts because we like to think of reason and uh, the importance of finding solution and dialogue between the nations. As you know, in politics, Oman was uh, uh, the leading country or the, that hosted the Iran-US uh, delegations or dialogue to find peace. And that ended after many years of secret meetings to uh, 
ذا اومان ذا ايران يو اس ديل نيوكليير ديل ذات انفورتشنتلي از يو نو ترامب ديسايدد نوت تو جو تو كانسل ات بات وي هوب ذات اتس كامينج ان ذا نيكست فيو دايز اند سو ذيس كايند اوف دايركشن از فيري امبورتنت فور ذا اوماني سبيريت تو كيب هارموني اند تو بوش بيس از ماتش از وي كان سو اجين ذيس بالانس رول was very important for Oman and it wasn't always easy to achieve. As I said in the beginning, it was always a process and uh, continuous uh, dialogue and uh, meetings and discussion to arrive to a uh, meeting point for the uh, different kind of uh, parties. Because as also once Sultan Qaboos was asked by a journalist, he prefers to put ethics and principles before interest. And that's probably one of the philosophies and the pillars for Oman and Oman culture is that we like to stand with the principles rather than being opportunistic and try to make profit from here and there. That's affected us in our journalism work. I didn't follow the slide as much as I wanted and uh, because it's slow, I think. And <laughs> So, but anyway, I'd like to talk to you again about uh, our Ro'ya model, business model. Uh, as we came late in Oman as a newspaper, we have realized that by 2009 and 10, after the internet, uh, news is not the most important thing that the media can deliver to the society. We have other things uh, that we can deliver to the society, and that's what we called in our organization the principles of hope. And as you know, we have worked in many initiatives, and in Arabi we called it Ilam al Mubadarat. So we like not just to wait and make news, we like to be part of the development in the society. And I'll give you examples uh, for that. We have made few awards, annual events awards, for the Omani youth, for example, because we have realized that these youth are very talented and they need motivation that who is the winner in IT, who is the winner in uh, Internet of Things, who, things like that. These themes were annual events and uh, for the last 10 years and part of the uh, Arroya's daily work, we develop or we construct initiatives to help the society to grow and to progress. Another un non-profit uh, initiative that we have done called Sinbad Mobile Library and it's a bus that go through the villages and make reading workshops. So that was very well, and it's part of our CSR initiative in the society. We cannot, media not always be a business model in 100%. Media is part of risala, as we say. It's a mission. You are trying to do and contribute to your society. And a place like Oman, relies a lot on the people who are educated, people who are enlightened, because they can see that the society in many sector, sectors need help. The government cannot do everything by itself. No government can do from A to Z. The society should build up itself and make initiative and contribute to the development. And by this kind of uh, thinking, the organization themselves, they blossom and grow and they also flourish and that helped us to make this model uh, of events and management of uh, conferences and uh, initiatives like awards and business award and we have the tourism award and we have the youth award and different uh, themes like that so keep our young uh, team and our Ru'ya always very busy and under lots of pressure that they have to combined between their work and journalism and other uh, alternatives way of doing media and journalism. It's not just the news. Okay, so we go back now to the effect of uh, Corona, of course, was definitely devastating uh, for the last two years and a half. And we are very happy that now we can, I can uh, talk to you without a mask and I am relaxed. Uh, we had a very tough uh, two or three years, not just Oman, but the whole world, as you all uh, experienced. And we are happy that uh, this damage that caused by this 
COVID-19 is we are in the process of uh, recovery and uh, we are uh, back to normal in many ways. Uh, the last thing I would like to talk about is, um, okay, okay, this tells you about the initiatives, but I skipped, it's okay. So please, yeah. Uh, very important I would like to talk about is the, the main challenges for media now in Oman as well as in other countries. It's the digital media or digital world. And I think rather when we think about it as a challenge, we should think about it as an opportunity for us because the digital media provide us with an amazing opportunity and we always should be part of the future. So all uh, Omani newspapers having websites, having Twitter, having Instagram, having uh, Snapshot and all the new uh, platforms that provided by uh, the internet and they are reaching to maximum people. Before, if a newspaper for uh, the Omani numbers 20,000 print, now you have an article that read by 100,000. It's an amazing thing. So we should not think of uh, digital as a threat, but rather an opportunity that can help us to reach to the people all the time throughout the time and anywhere. Because as I said, Oman is a very vast country and we cannot have newspaper delivered to all the villages, but internet now is available in 95% of Oman. So people in all the isolated area can be part of the internet and follow the website and follow Twitter and be part of the news. So, okay. So anyway, that was in brief the story of the Omani media. I would like to thank you again for uh, your listening and thank you very much. شكرا للمكرم حاتم الطائي انا رمقني يوسف الهوتي بنظره كذا يعني شويه خوفتني آه وهذه النظره تقول انه لازم اقرا من الورقه آه السيره الذاتيه مره اخرى كيف بنواف راح مثل ما ذكرت لكم السيدة ليندا باباس كانت حاضرة في مسقط ويمكن زارت عمان لفترات جدا طويلة هي متخصصة في تاريخ الشرق الأوسط والشؤون الجارية والدراسات الإسلامية بصفتها أستاذة مساعدة قامت بتدريس دورات في كلية هود جامعة ماونت سانت ماري وحاليا في فريدريك معهد التعلم في التنمية التابعة لكلية ماريلاند المجتمعية As I mentioned earlier, Alinda Papas, uh, we are honored that we have her in uh, Muscat uh, for many years. Uh, she is a specialist in the Middle Eastern history, uh, current affairs and Islamic studies. Uh, and as just a professor, she has taught courses at uh, Hood College, Mount uh, uh, St. Mary's University. And you can find her bio at page, on page 29. Thank you. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. First, I would wish to thank this afternoon His Excellency Musa Hamdan Ta'i, Ambassador of the Sultanate of, of Oman to the United States, the Oman Journalists Association, and Kathleen Rodolfo, uh, the Executive Director of the Sultan Qaboos Cultural Center in Washington. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this very important forum. 
I am indeed honored to share this stage with such a distinguished group of friends and colleagues who share with me an abiding admiration for Oman, a country that reigns as a good news story in the Middle East. The topic I have been asked to discuss is one that is central to the history and evolution of the Omani state. It is also critical to the remarkable resurgence of Oman, which began in the late 20th century, when His Majesty, the late and legendary Qaboos bin Said, Sultan of Oman, assumed power and set his beloved country upon a course of enlightened modernization and development. It is a legacy that continues under the leadership of his successor, Sultan Haitham bin Tariq. I will begin with an apology. I stand in front of an audience that is largely Omani and one that is all too familiar with the important role that women in the Sultanate play in private and public life. However, my research is intended for the most part for a Western audience, one that holds many unfortunate notions about Arab and Muslim women. The story of women in Oman is one that must be told, for it has elements of both continuity, modernization, and hope. The role of women in Oman is a subject with which I have been preoccupied for many years. When I first visited the Sultanate in the 1970s, at the very beginning of the Renaissance, the sense of promise and excitement throughout the land was palpable. Oman was on the move again. As in centuries past, its success would depend in large part on the participation of women. However, under the leadership of Sultan Qaboos, their role in Oman's modern journey would evolve not only in the traditional private domestic sector, but also on the very public national stage as well. For the people of Oman, cultural identity born of a long and distinguished history, is cherished. Omanis know where they've been, know where they are, and today have a fairly good idea of where they're going. For both men and women, theirs is a story of challenge, resilience, and tenacity throughout history and well into the modern age. Omani, Oman is a country that remains largely under the radar, not only in the mainstream media, but also to some extent in the context of research relating to women's studies. This is unfortunate, as its history, both ancient and modern, is compelling. Geography, to a very large extent, has shaped the world view of the people of Oman. Oman's history is a hint's history of interaction, not insularity. It is a history of maritime transactions. With the desert at its back and the Indian Ocean at, at its doorstep, its window to the world, if you like, Oman lies at the crossroads of ancient and modern trade routes. In the ancient world, Oman, known as the land of Magan, was one of the most significant transit hubs in the ancient world. It served as a major entrepot along historic trade routes, both by land and especially by sea. Omani merchants were skilled in maritime navigation, trading with the peoples of ancient Sumeria and the Indus Valley. Omanis made their mark on global exchange and commerce. Oman was a source of copper vital to the manufacture of bronze and frankincense, a resin derived from the Boswellia sacra tree, which valued more highly than gold. When considering Omani history, it's essential to consider women in their historical context. 
as a leading scholar of the feminist movement has affirmed, Arab women are not just starting to take control of their own narrative. Women in Oman were participating in national life, including in the public sphere, well before the era of modernization. In a materially significant way, because of Oman's role as a maritime nation, and more recently as a colonial power. And here we might consider the famous legendary Queen Shamsa, the Queen of Oman, who is seen here in a depiction making a trade agreement with the Akkadian King Sargon in the third millennia before the Common Age. Women's labor was instrumental in the national life of Oman before the era of modernization, largely because of Oman's role as a maritime power and also as a colonial enterprise. The labor of Omani women was critical to the commercial endeavors of their society as they painstakingly wove thousands upon thousands of miles of sturdy rope made of coconut palm fiber used to join the timbers of those majestic sailing ships, the dhows. During all this time, women were integral to the preservation of society in Oman, particularly as agents of continuity. Omani sailors and merchants were absent from home for extended periods of time, for months and even for years. Supported in part by remittances from abroad, Omani women remained at home for the most part, assuming responsibility for the day-to-day -day management of their households. They ensured the community's welfare by overseeing finances, defending themselves, managing the life giving, sustaining fellaj systems, and even issuing fetwas, effectively acting as guarantors of societal stability and cohesion. Sorry, couldn't resist these old photos. Are you, no? Right. Women continued to assume these roles throughout the age of empire. In the 19th century, the Omani Empire, as we know, ruled from the island of Zanzibar, stretched from Southern Arabia to the Horn of Africa, to the northern borders of Portuguese-controlled Mozambique and Zanzibar, and beyond. During the late 19th, early 20th century, Oman largely faded from worldview, slipping into obscurity. It was known as the Hermit Kingdom, the Tibet of the Middle East. In many ways, at least in terms of infrastructure, a medieval backwater, isolated, impoverished, xenophobic. By the mid 20th century, there were 10 kilometers of paved road, virtually no national infrastructure, suc successionist wars in Dofar, attempted attempt, attempts to usurp the Sultan's power in the north, etc., etc. You are more familiar with this than I. However, on July 23rd, 1970, a new dawn was marked for the people of Oman. And this new dawn would largely be a top-down development effort at modernization. From the very beginning of his long, illustrious reign, His Majesty Sultan Qaboos believed that women had an integral part in the development of the Sultanate. If the energy, capability, and enthusiasm of women were excluded from a country's national life, then that country would be depriving itself of 50% of its genius. He also, as you know, frequently used the metaphor of a bird with two wings and suggested that one being male, one being female, a bird could not uh, take flight without both wings. Lovely. 
again, as a top-down phenomenon, uh, Sultan Qaboos very early on um, recognized women in such a number of ways. Uh, we are all familiar with the fact that October 17th is a date which is celebrated annually in Oman as Omani Women's Day, one of his many efforts to promote and encourage and recognize uh, women's accomplishments. What is most important is that his twin pillars of development evolved around education and health care. And it was education which actually, in my opinion, was the engine of modernization and the engine of empowerment for women as well. When he assumed the reins of state, there were three primary schools in the entire country for boys only, with a total enrollment of less than 900. There were no public schools for girls. And so he said, we will teach our children even under the shade of trees. And so that happened even as schools were being constructed at a breakneck pace. Schools for girls were established for the first time in Oman. The basic law of the state, Oman's constitution, states that education is the cornerstone for progress in the society, which the state fosters and endeavors to disseminate and make accessible to all. And in this regard, Oman's, Oman's efforts can certainly stand out as an amazing achievement. Women have certainly embraced the opportunity toward education. As we can see, 1970, no schools for girls. By 2021, adult female literacy was above 95%. Oman has also been cited quite favorably for its public expenditure in education as a percentage of its GDP, recently ranking 17th highest in the world. Higher education from women is one of the many successes of the story of Oman in the, in Oman's women in the public sphere. Of course, the premier public university, Sultan Qaboos University, uh, has 15,000 plus students, founded in 1986, and one of its chief administrators is Her Highness Dr. Mona. Uh, Women students un, uh, compose more than 50% of the undergraduates at SQU and approximately 35% of the graduate students. This in a country that 50 years ago did not have public education for women. Just to put things in historical perspective, I think this is absolutely astounding. 62% of Omani studying abroad are female. Now? <laughs> we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, and then, of course, in healthcare. In 1970, there were no public fun publicly funded hospitals or health centers in Oman. Life expectancy for the average Omani was 47 years. Life expectancy today is quite different. Almost 78 years for Omanis across the board, ranking 47th in the world. Regularly hailed by such agencies as the United Nations Development Program. And so many Omani women rank highly in the fields of not only education but health care as well. Here we see the former president, founder of the Oman Cancer Society, icons in the field of mental health. And I will apologize in advance. Today I am just sharing with you a sampling of the tens of thousands of women who excel in many, many fields in Oman. But this is just to give you all an idea. I'm sure you're familiar with these ladies, but certainly a Western audience would not be. 
political participation, indeed, women's political rights, previously non-existent in the conservative Arab Gulf states, have undergone extraordinary growth in recent years, certainly in Oman. It has been cited as one of the more progressive states in the Gulf region in the area of women's rights, standing as a model for other countries in the Gulf. Many political firsts for Omani women. Oman was the first country in the GCC to grant women the right to vote. In 1994, women were invited to vote and stand for election in the Mejlis Ashura. Two women were elected that year. In 1997, two women were appointed to the Mejlis Adaula. And by 2002, universal suffrage was granted to all. I don't need to tell this group that Oman has a bicameral parliament, uh, which is uh, the upper house of which is appointed, the lower elected, which is very interesting because we're going to talk about elections in a moment. Um, I had the great honor uh, two or three years ago to interview Dr. Badria, who uh, has been appointed deputy chair in the Mejlis Adaula, one of many ladies to serve with distinction in the upper house, the upper chamber of the Omani parliament, the Mejlis Oman. Political partic participation today is a subject of great interest and sometimes controversy. Um, Omani women are certainly invited to vote. Uh, these photos were taken in 2011 during the campaigning for the Mejlis Shura election. Uh, the billboards all over the capital region. But alas, the results were not very favorable in that year. Only one woman was elected, do you remember that? To the Mejlis Shura. So this is a topic that we can discuss at length. It certainly is one that's very, very important. What are the social and political, no, beg your pardon, social and cultural obstacles to women's pro political partic participation? Among many that have been suggested is tribalism, patriarchy, family honor, lack of awareness, confidence, lack of public exposure and political knowledge. And this is borne out in my many, many interviews with ladies in Oman. Lack of public exposure and political knowledge. And then, of course, there's the public-private space dichotomy, which also uh, falls into place here. But as I said earlier, women's emergence into the public domain has, to a large part, been the result of top-down development. And we see this certainly in terms of government service. Dr. Rawia was, as you know, the first woman, female first woman minister with portfolio in the GCC, appointed by His Majesty Sultan Qaboos in 2004, and just recently retired after a distinguished career. Ambassador retired Hunayna bin Sultan al Mughayri was Oman's ambassador to the United States from 2005 to 2020. She represented the first Arab woman to serve as an ambassador to the United States. And she has since been followed by several uh, Middle Eastern female counterparts in Washington, as well as throughout the world. Her sister, talk about a sister duo for a period of time. While Ambassador Hunayna was here in Washington, her sister was the, U the Omani permanent representative at the United Nations, uh, also a pro former ambassador to Germany. Quite a distinguished duo. Today, there are three female ministers serving in the government's cabinet. And let us reflect for a moment if we might on the notion of female empowerment and the state. It's certainly a win-win situation for all, isn't it? Women's empowerment is very often framed as patriotic. And many women with whom I've spoken say, well, we must succeed. We've been given these opportunities. It would be almost, uh, it would be unpatriotic 
not to take advantage and, and contribute to our country. Look at what our country has done for us. If we succeed, the nation succeeds. Uh, women are, of course, empowered and fulfilled by participation. Uh, as they contribute to national development, they gain agency. And I'm going to speed along here because I'm probably running out of time. How are we doing? Okay? All right. Good. All right, okay? Because I got a lot of stuff here. <laughs> okay. Um, now, I want to give you just a, an overview of women in the workforce. Um, women, unlike many of their sisters in the Khalij, in the countries of, of the Gulf, you will find women of Oman working in a variety of professions. Um, not only the uh, celebrated professions of, you know, medicine and education, and healthcare, uh, but uh, baggage handlers, security officers, um, truck drivers. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, of course, uh, there are voluntary organizations as well in Oman, and the leading organization is the Oman Women's Association, which uh, most, by most recent account, had 65 branches throughout the country. I've been privileged to visit many of these branches from the Far to Musandam. Uh, these are an amazing group of women volunteers who do very, very good works in their community and feel very strongly about empowering women through training and education and tutoring. Uh, these are just some photos of the training centers at some of the uh, Oman Women Organization uh, headquarters. Women have a desire to give back. This has been a narrative that I've heard repeated time and time again in Oman. Uh, women in the labor force. We thought these were all sort of Western ideas. Uh-uh. Gender discrimination is strictly prohibited. Equal pay for equal work. And they didn't even have to boycott and march for it. Fully paid maternity leave. Fully paid leave for widows. Retirement age for women. Social security benefits. And then women at the ultimate levels of the economic uh, arena. Uh, we, we see there the sound of breaking glass, and I know many in this room are probably familiar with everyone you're about to see. Um, Forbes in that 2020 listed 20, I beg your pardon, nine Omani women among their most powerful list of business women in the Middle East. And again, I'm a historian, so I see these numbers from a historical perspective in the course of just a few decades. Entrepreneurship, our friend Hin Bahwan is cited again and again as a leading businesswoman in her country. There have been many government initiatives to assist women in entrepreneurial uh, pursuits. Uh, here are just some of them. Uh, some of them are just governmental initiatives Many of them are supported by major corporations. Shell in Oman has been one in particular that has helped women with the entrepreneurship. And then I always like to remember the small entrepreneurs, the small business women. Um, I have such fun chatting with these ladies. Uh, Fatima, rose water, producing and manufacturing rose water in the Jebel Akhtar. Frankincense sellers, traditional crafts, and then we get on to how important tradition is in, in, in the modernization of Oman. And here are just some very, very fleeting examples of food and beverage industry. And then, of course, Omanization. Women have a large role to play in Omanization. By chance, I happened to take that photograph some three or four years ago in Muscat. Um, requesting female helpers uh, and Omani females to work in the Omanization program. Airline pilots. Truck drivers. 
taxi drivers, a new taxi service by and for women in Oman. How exciting is that? Yay! Um, so across the spectrum, again, not just in the you know, so, sort of lofty professions, but everywhere. And this is what um, I find so exciting about uh, women in the public arena in Oman in sports. Women's national soccer team was first established in 2005. There are many, many sports teams for women now across all areas of athletics. Now? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Please keep us posted, by all means. Uh, now? Yeah. Oh, International Women's Day? That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, of course, women, uh, Omani women, have been represented at the Olympics. And I really love this quote from Habib Hanai. Yes? yes? Really? Oh my goodness! Bravo! Bravo! That's fabulous. I love this. Um, professional tennis. Okay, now you all know these names, but again, this would be kind of a revelation to people who are not familiar with Oman. Drag racing, whoa, usually a male domain, right? A long time. And then I, I, I had the privilege also of meeting with, um, with Nadir al Hathi, yes, who was the first Omani woman to scale the top of Mount Everest. So again, in athletics, just amazing, amazing pursuits. Amazing pursuits. Um, now, women's sports are acknowledged in Oman as something very, very important. And uh, we learned just last year that uh, His Highness, the Crown Prince of Oman, uh, established the Omani Women's Sports and Cultural Innovation Club to recognize the potential of women and to affirm their accomplishments to support women in all of their roles in sports and culture. An award-winning Omani journalist, Man Booker Award Prize winner, again in the national arena, making Oman and Omanis proud. In the fine arts, Ali El Farsi. Preserving Omani identity through her art. When interviewed, this is what she told me. Preserving Omani identity through her art. Again, the balance between tradition and modernization. So what do we have to learn from the journey of Omani women in the public sphere, particularly in the past 50 years? That, and I'm looking at my friend Rufia here because I think we've discussed this, that the, there is not a dichotomy between tradition and modernization. They are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> tradition and modernity are not static, but rather dynamic. Women in anywhere, but particularly in Oman, have demonstrated that they can be both modern and traditional. That Islamic values and feminism are not necessarily in conflict. Very importantly, modernity and progress should not be measured by a woman's appearance. Women can assume multiple identities, multiple feminisms, if you will. And Omani women are very comfortable in their own skins. Yesterday was International Women's Day, and Sultan Haitham bin Tariq recognized this by saying that we are keen for women to enjoy their rights guaranteed by law and to work side by side with men in various fields. For the first time in modern history, we have a publicly recognized First Lady of Oman, who will certainly serve as a role model for many young girls and women as well. So let's just consider the next generation, the renewed Renaissance where Omani girls and women face the future with confidence. 
Over the past 50 years, women in Oman have responded to the call to participate in national development, eagerly embracing the opportunities that have been made available by an enlightened leader and now his successor. Since 1970, they have passed milestones that would have been unthinkable, unthinkable to their grandmothers. They are pursuing their dreams, realizing their potential, and serving as role models for generations to come. In this modern era, challenges exist, remain, to be sure. Yet my research and observations over the course of many years have revealed a strength, determination, and optimism that is exceptional in the region. Women of Oman are eager to move forward as their country does. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. Shukran Jazilan, it was a great um, uh, presentation and thanks a lot. You took us through a lot of uh, stories. Some of them, uh, they still uh, very important to the youth in Oman uh, today. Um, great uh, examples uh, from different uh, sectors. Thanks a lot. Umazilna fi alam sahafa wal mar'a. Ustaz Yusuf Akra, lazim Akra. هاي حسيتك يعني يعني لا لا الأستاذة جيهان بدأت مسيرتها الإعلامية في تلفزيون دولة الكويت ومذيعة أخبار ومقدمة برامج سياسية عضو مؤسس في مجلس إدارة جمعية الصحفيين العمانية وأسست اللجنة الثقافية ولجنة شؤون الصحفيات بجمعية الصحفيين العمانية مهتمة بشؤون المرأة وحقوق الإنسان وسفيرة النوايا الحسنة في المنظمة التنموية للطاقة المتجددة قدمت أيضا الكثير من البرامج التلفزيونية بينها برامج متخصصة في الشأن السياسي بالإضافة إلى أننا ننتظر دائما طلتها عبر نشرة الأخبار الرئيسية في تلفزيون سلطنة عمان أنا ما أشوف النشرة أحيانا إذا جامعة تقدمها Now we have Jihan Al Lamki. Uh, Jihan Al Lamki began her media career with Kuwait State TV as news anchor and a political program presenter. She is founding member of the board of directors of the Omani Journalists Association and founded the Cultural Committee and the Women uh, Journalist Affairs Committee of the uh, Journalists Association. She is co she's concerned with the women's affairs and human rights and a goodwill ambassador in the Renewable Energy Development Organization. The stage is yours, ma'am. Please welcome him. Assalamu alaikum. I'm going to speak in English. God bless you. Is it time? السلام عليكم أتوجه بالشكر لمركز السلطان قابوس الثقافي وسفارة سلطنة عمان في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية وجمعية الصحفيين العمانية على هذا الحدث المهم لإظهار دور عمان في صناعة الإعلام الجاد والمتزن أهنئ نفسي أهنئ كل الحاضرات بيوم المرأة العالمي الذي وافق يوم أمس وهي فرصة جيدة للحديث عن المرأة العمانية في المجال الصحفي I would like to thank the Sultan Qaboos Cultural Center and the Embassy of the Sultanate of Oman in the United States of America and the Omani Journalism Association for putting efforts into organizing this important event in order to show Omani role in a serious and balanced media. I congratulate myself and all the attendees uh, on the International Women's Day. 
which took place yesterday and it is a good opportunity to talk about Omani women in the journalistic field. I am Jihan Alamke. I introduce myself to you as a news and political broadcaster on the Sultanate of Oman TV for 23 years. I'm not. <laughs> Before that, I worked um, on Kuwait TV State, Kuwait State TV as a news anchor. I will start with you with my experience in the Arab media. And the most important of these milestones are the attacks on the World Trade Tower and its effects on me an event that changed the course of the world and opened the door wide to the war on terrorism and changed my path on a personal level as a junior anchor on the Kuwait Channel TV. At that moment, the phone rang in the coffee room. I sat there watching the news on Al Jazeera in a shock. It is the moment that changed my course and my thinking about the responsibility of the letter and the word. I remember that moment as I ran to the news studio to report the news to all channels, ask what happened and what is that trade tower. The tragedy struck my mind after that was that TV presentation is an experience, awareness, and respect for the mind of the viewers. This is how I started, and the journey continues to this day. As for the women in the press in Oman, women in Oman had a role in establishing the Omani media and displaying images of gender balance in the field of life. In 1972, where is she? In 1972, she was the first Omani journalist, Lamis Atai, in the Emirati newspaper, Al Ittihad. Then she wrote in Al Wata newspaper, which is the first private Omani newspaper. Later on, she was editor in chief of Al Omania magazine. Mm. And the Omani radio, the woman was pre present at the first female voice presented by Muna Mahfoud, who was the first woman on Beit Al Falaj broadcast. In the year 75, Rahma bint Hussein, my mother, My mother. Ah, she looks beautiful. Yeah, I look like her. <laughs> yeah. She was she was also Yes. <laughs> she was also one of the first female presenters in the radio. And then both of Rahma and Muna and others appeared on T V in the nineteen seventy five. Right? I took I take time. Okay, the moment I was there. Yeah. So um, here's one also one of the most important journalists in Oman. Fatma Ghulam. She is she was the first female journalist. She got involved in hard work. 
She started her career in 1976 as a press editor specialized in conducting interviews, surveys, and investigative journalism. Her work continued for many years. She told me through my program, Shaqa'iq, which I was presenting leading women in Oman. I, I did the interview with her and we spoke about many topics. She described to me one of the hum humanitarian awareness campaigns carried out by the Ministry of Health in the early 80s. And it required access to the area overlooking the Gulf of Oman, which bears the name of Al Sifa, which required hours to reach due to the rugged road. On the strip, which was attended by an Omani doctor, the life of a child was saved to be transferred to the hospital due the lack of hospital in that area. As you know, before 1970, educational opportunities were not available in Oman. The media was one of encouraging factors for women's demand for education and eradication of illiteracy, which was widespread in addition to the role of the media health awareness, which was done through the production of joint television programs in the 80s in, in cooperation with the World Health Organization, followed by the production of programs concerned with family issues presented by Hanan al-Kindi and Tahir al-Lawatiya for years. As for the children's programs, they were presented on the Omani screen by Fathiyya Muhammad, she was presenting children's programs, Rahma Hussein, my mother, and Kaltham Muhammad. And these programs represented a qualitative leap in entertainment and presenting children's talents. Um, yeah. And if we talk about challenges, there are many of them. Social challenges. The appearance of women on the screen was not easy for a constructive society that sticks to customs and traditions. In spite of that, the television and radio voices received wide social welcome. And this may be due to the lack of to the lack of women's appearance in the media due to the family due to the family's reservation to appear with the beginning of the 80s the turnout on the screen became greater and the issue of women family and youth expanded through specialized programs offered by women And the social challenge was working for late hours and reconciling children's education with work. And this is a difficult challenge that women face due to the fact that they shoulder most of responsibilities of the house. In late 90s, a beginning of 2000s, women have proven their presence widely with the development of social thought and the need for women to appear in a more bigger in the media. In terms of wages, there was no problem and it is and it still is. There is justice in income between women and women, women and men, but the biggest challenge is the presence of women in media leadership positions, which require greater effort to to prove their presence than men. This is a reality that exists everywhere in the world, which distanced her even today. 
Women in media decision making centers, which requires giving them real opportunities. Among the challenges is also job dropout from private newspapers and magazines to government work and other sectors to, due to low wages. Among the positives that we have to mention is social media, which formed an opportunity to show new talents in Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat. We also have to mention that the private radio stations have contributed to the emergence of women to form high percentage in presenting daily and social programs to peak hours. in addition to covering local and economic files, but the private radios have not yet entered the level of political discourse. So this is my mother and this is me with her and, and her TV program. I was famous at that time also. <laughs> I'm not in this picture, but I'm here with her again with my cousin. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to speak about the activities of uh, the Women Journalist Committee at the OJA. We had many activities and uh, good numbers of uh, members, women members. So this was one of the first activities that we established, uh, Omani Women Journalism Dialogue. This was in 2010. And this was in 2010 as also. This was the second Omani Women Journalism Dialogue in 2014. And we had like many objectives at the committee one of them is enhancing the contribution of the Omani journalists in the media field of all kinds, understand the role of the media and the success of women's participation in the Shura Council, and monitoring the challenges that face Omani women in press in the Sultanate. So in result, Women presence have increased in Oman in all sections in media, newspapers, radio, television, but we must work hard to prove ourselves and we must to more work more in motivating women to provide content and media materials and giving women opportunities to be able to be in decision-making centers like men. Thank you for listening. Shukran, Sada Jihan. Shukran, Jazeelan. Lucky, thank you. Actually, we're going now to our last and end session with a person in America she's known. Uh, Simon Zgardi Kertz, but I will say that's in Arabic also for the uh, Omani delegation. He is the Chief of the Ministry of the Middle East and the Middle East, AMAEI, and the Middle East of Pittsburgh, which is a national institution, a non-profit institution, which was created in 2008. It helps the companies and the educational and cultural institutions between the United States and the United States. ودول الشرق الأوسط وشمال أفريقيا على مر السنين قادت سمن العديد من الوفود إلى الشرق الأوسط واستضافت في بيتسبرغ العديد من الوفود رفيعة المستوى من الشرق الأوسط بما في ذلك العديد من رجال الأعمال وصاحبات الأعمال من سلطنة عمان Please, you welcome If you, if you like Good afternoon, everyone. Um, 
I feel rather anticlimactic coming up on stage after that uh, amazing conversation. So, and, and it's wrapping up and everyone's tired. So I'm, I don't actually have a very long um, presentation, so you'll be happy to know that. But I hope, uh, I, hope I will communicate some important information. And, um, and, if, and if you have questions um, beyond what we discussed today, please feel free to get in touch with me. Um, I'd like to uh, first thank uh, His Excellency Ambassador um, Altai. Thank you very much for being a host of this, as well as uh, Kathleen Rodolfo of this, this beautiful Sultan Qaboos Cultural Center. I remember the old cultural center. I've been here already a couple of times, but this is, it always makes me happy to be here. And uh, also the uh, Omani Journalists Association. I think uh, you've presented an opportunity to really have some important discussions. So I'm, I'm proud to be part of this. Hopefully I won't have any te technical difficulties, but uh, uh, bear with me if we do. <laughs> so um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, let's see here. How do I get it to switch? Ah, there we go. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the American Middle East Institute. Um, it's an independent nonprofit organization that I founded almost 15 years ago. And we are headquartered in Pittsburgh, but we're a national, international organization. And we believe in building business, educational, and cultural ties with the countries of the Middle East. And uh, there's a little shot of our, of our city of Pittsburgh. I hope you will come to Pittsburgh. I have hosted many delegations from Oman in Pittsburgh. And uh, in fact, the first was um, uh, Sayed Badr al Busaidi, uh, His Excellency the Foreign Minister, uh, who at that time was the Secretary General. And he came with an entourage. He came with Ambassador Hunaina, Ambassador Liutha. Uh, they were at my home. They participated in a grand conference we put on. And um, uh, there were others also as part of the delegation. And I love Oman. I love the Omani people. And we also had a successive, we had a um, delegation from the, from, the Pits, from the Pittsburgh area also go over to Oman following that um, delegation that Sayed Butter led. So I have a soft spot in my heart for Oman and was privileged and honored uh, that Sayed Badr uh, appointed me as Honorary Consul of Oman in Pittsburgh. And I'm very honored about that. Um, we connect businesses through our, our network. We've developed a, a large network of companies and universities um, and um, educational cultural um, missions that we um, have taken to the Middle East, that we have hosted from the Middle East, business missions, of course, and we all always have an annual business conference. We, we haven't been able to have it for the past two years, but uh, we've had some sort of virtual versions of them. So these are some of the industries that we have focused on um, with the um, American Middle East Institute. And um, you'll see that you, I wanted to mention something about Pittsburgh, and that is that, you know, we really are a center of higher education. We have something like 34 colleges and universities uh, in our region, and they really are bookended by uh, the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University, and there is so much technology being developed and there's such a great connection between industry and the universities and these universities also um, those two are get more research dollars than almost any uh, from the US government than almost any universities in the country so there is a lot going on in education um, in manufacturing, in healthcare, we're a leader in healthcare. Um, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, they call it UPMC. It's the largest health employer in the United States. And many firsts have happened there. Transplant medicine was invented there by Thomas Starzl. The polio vaccine was invented uh, in the, I guess, the 50s by Jonas Salk. So um, there are a lot of things that are, that are happening in Pittsburgh. Robotic medicines, it's, it's unbelievable. Also autonomy, driverless cars, more driverless cars, research centers than any place um, in the United States. Uh, center of uh, finance, cyber security, 
uh, you have to come see. Come to, come to Pittsburgh and we'll show you around. Um, let's see here. Let's keep. <laughs> Do the witch people? The Amish. <laughs> you know, the Amish generally are on the east side of, uh, of Pennsylvania, believe it or not. Um, but there are also some in Ohio on the west. <laughs> You know, the Amish is still, um, if you travel to Lancaster towards, you know, towards Philadelphia, which is on the far east, if you think of Pennsylvania as a big rectangle, you will see um, that Pen uh, Pittsburgh is on the west side of the rest rectangle. So on the left side of the rectangle and the Philadelphia is on the east. And that's where you'll find more of the Amish. And then also some in Ohio, as I mentioned. So um, I wanted to mention uh, that I was delighted that um, his Excellency Ambassador Altai could be part of a webinar we had last year in the middle of the pandemic. And uh, he gave some excellent um, pointers about what's going on in Oman. And if you want to establish a business there, he was also talking with a um, fairly new ambassador, uh, Ambassador Leslie So. And um, I remember one thing that stuck with me was that Ambassador Tai said that, you know, Oman really works hard to make it easy for companies to establish their businesses there. And I remember that you mentioned the sort of one-stop shop kind of um, um, sort of system where they bring all of these different, you know, all the different permissions or different things that you might need to have. It can all be in one place and you don't have to go to like 40 different organizations. They really want to expedite uh, and make it easy for uh, U.S. companies to, to locate um, in, in Oman. So I also wanted to talk about the um, I was asked to talk about the free trade agreement, which Oman has uh, with the United States. Um, I think it's, I mean, first of all, there's only 20, 20 free trade agreements throughout the entire globe. So this is not something that, that happens frequently. And, I, uh, and so Oman is one of those 20. When you think how many, I don't know how many countries there are in the world, 180 or something. So when you think about, um, when you think about that, uh, that really is a statement about Oman and how progressive it is and how it wants to you know, open up to the world, open up to the West. They're a great friend, as we've learned in this you know, ex excellent exchange today of ideas about, uh, there's a long history that Oman has, a, a very positive history that Oman has with the United States. So this uh, free trade agree agreement started in um, January. Of, well, it was entered into force in January 2009. It's now 13 years old. Um, Oman, that means that, well, there are many benefits to the free trade agreement, but it means that Oman can export to the U.S. duty-free, no taxes or tariffs, and uh, U.S. companies can export to Oman duty-free. And so that, that means that they can sell their products more cheaply. They don't have to pass it on to, uh, to the consumer. And so they have a, then a competitive advantage. So the, the free trade agreements are excellent when they're, when they're implemented and, and followed. Um, and the U.S. actually started that, you know, wanted to have these trade agreements to reduce barriers uh, to U.S. exports and protect U.S. intellectual property and have standards that everyone follows. And then everyone sees the fairness of it for both sides. So it's a win-win proposition. And I'm, I'm very proud to be associated with Oman and to tell people that, you know, Oman has a free trade agreement and let's, let's talk about who you should who you should talk to. I mean, there are many, many um, professionals who work on connecting U.S. businesses to Oman, or U.S., you know, in every, in every country, of course, there's an embassy, a U.S. embassy, and they have a commercial attache. They have many people that, um, that work on, um, you know, connecting uh, businesses uh, in those particular countries. And Oman also has an excellent, um, I want to give a shout out to their um, Oman business, that's called the Oman American Business Center. And the people there, I'd like to recognize Rebecca Olson, who runs it. And she, her, um, our former intern at our institute is Tasneem Al-Busaidi. And uh, they're, they're a great team, they have a great staff. Um, and um, I mentioned them up there. So I'm gonna just play a few, uh, like a minute of this video, if I can actually, make it happen here. Hold on a second. 
I might need. Uh oh. <laughs> it's. <laughs> Wait a minute. I, I gotta back up a second. Uh, how do I back it up? That way. So this was made by the um, the business center in Oman and also the U.S. Emb embassy in Oman in, in collaboration. So I'll, I'll stop it there and just um, just to try to keep to um, schedule. Um, I don't know how to get back to come. Hold on a second. <laughs> Sorry, was it this? <laughs> Hopeless, there we go. <laughs> okay, I think that's, we can start there. So, um, so you can see the opportunities for U.S. companies listed oil and gas, uh, renewable energy, transportation and logistics, um, information and communications technology, mining and minerals, and then there are other different industries, smaller and larger, that um, you know come up with their own um, um, sort of projects that they want to do in Oman. Uh, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about some of the things we've done, some of our work. Um, we, we have hosted, as I mentioned earlier, many dignitaries from Oman. I've been very proud to meet some of the, I mean, just excellent people, you know, starting with uh, Sayed Badr al-Busaidi, al and then I mentioned um, uh, the ambassadors, um, the, the sisters, Hunaina and Liutha. Um, we had had this minister of health. Uh, who told an amazing story about, um, you know, what it was like when he was born. He was born as a twin, but they didn't even know there was a second child inside. And it was, it was such an interesting story, the way he told it, told it, and just how, you know, how far health care has come in Oman. I mean, his mother could have died in birth. I mean, the, just all the things that used to happen. It's amazing when you go to modern Oman and you see how, just how beautiful and just, I mean, it's just the most, I, I'm going to be there the week of March 20th, and I, I'm so excited. <laughs> I'll be back. Um, and Dr. Ra Rawia, uh, she, has, she has spoken at our events. We've had the Minister of Oil and Gas. Um, there you see a shot of um, um, Ambassador Honaina with uh, Steve Wozniak, who we had for our 10th anniversary conference. And uh, he spoke to a crowd of like 2,000 in this beautiful hall in um, in Pittsburgh called the Carnegie Music Hall in Pittsburgh. They say Carnegie in Pittsburgh, which is how Andrew Carnegie pronounced it. So, so there, not Carnegie. Anyway, <laughs> this is, um, and he was signing autographs. You can see him. We had some fancy dinner beforehand. Um, 
here's a sampling of some of our past speakers, um, and there you see um, Sayed Badr. And um, let's see here. We've done a whole conference devoted to uh, Oman, and um, that was the former head of uh, the Salton Caboose Cultural Center, Ambassador Elizabeth McCune. You can see some of the other, um, His Excellency Al Harthi, uh, who at that time was the mayor of Mo Muscat. Um, a project we did um, was uh, with Roger Willis, the president of Universal Well Services. He's retired now. Uh, and this was a project with Oman Oil Company. And he, um, this is at the end of the, this team of Omani engineers went and were trained at Universal Well Services. And they, um, they presented him with a, um, oh, how to start, do the Oman, <laughs> right? And, uh, and there he is. He's an official Omani. And, um, and there's, some of the, there's some of the team that was, um, that was trained. And this big facility um, uh, in the, uh, that serves the oil industry. And this is uh, part of a delegation we took um, of health representatives. I mentioned UPMC. They also have a, a premier children's hospital. So we were meeting with some Omani health officials. Uh, we've had um, some uh, different uh, student programs. Um, Washington, we had a partnership with Washington and Jefferson University, which is just outside of Pittsburgh. Um, and we had Omani students come and be paired with American students um, for part of the summer. And then the whole group went and um, were, continued to be paired. They went back, they went to Oman and, and they studied Omani dialect. And they were actually, they were, these students were paired with each other and they were teaching each other their respective languages. And they even wanted, to, you know, the Americans were learning Omani dialect. And uh, we even created our own textbook about that. It was, it was a great experience for them. Here you can see them in America. We took some of them to the, um, uh, to the Capitol. There they are at a baseball game. That was our, our final dinner in this uh, giant, uh, the, the US Steel Tower. That was atop the US Steel Tower, their um, um, conference room. So we had a nice final dinner there. And here they are when they then went to Oman. And uh, those two guys on the upper left-hand side are my, two of my sons, my, two of my oldest sons. I have four boys, so they're, they're in official Omani garb. <laughs> um, had a wonderful time. I mean, um, I think I, we were talking at lunch. John Duke Anthony said, you know, you take people to these countries. He's taken many, many congressmen, many, many people. And, you know, it just changes. Your words were, it changes their lives. Um, and, and I can't emphasize enough how, um, oh, it's changed my life to be connected to Oman and to have spent time there and, and to go to some of the other countries that I, uh, that I know. I mean, you have to go there, you have to experience the people, and, and that's a depth of knowledge that you can't just imagine. You can't even do it by Zoom. You have to go there. So that's, um, that's my presentation. Um, I'm happy to take any questions um, if, you, if you like. To my knowledge, there are no U.S. banks in Oman. To what extent, if any, does that hinder um, cooperation, business, commercial cooperation between well, the two countries? I can't specifically speak to that, but I'll I'll tell you that um, there are many there there are many banks in Dubai. There are many U.S banks uh, that have a branch there. And so it seems like Dubai, which is enormous and is a very different animal than, than you might find in other parts of the Middle East. Certainly it's, I mean, I love that Muscat is like a knowable place. Dubai is kind of crazy. <laughs> but uh, so, um, I, so I don't think there is any kind of problem, though, with any, uh, any sort of banking. I know that Oman is very open to, you know, the, the kinds of funding that is that is necessary to s establish a business in Oman. So, I don't I don't think U.S. companies have any problem with that sort of thing. And you know, I'm not the expert in all those details, but I can refer you to the experts. So there are, as I mentioned, they're they're at the embassy, um, they're part of the U.S. government, and there are others who are professional consultants on some of these specific uh, financial um, questions or other questions. If I may, uh, yes. Simon, I just uh, interrupt. You actually answered eloquently. You know, it's I am also not an expert in banking. Uh, Citibank was in Oman and closed a few years back. 
and unfortunately you know that is normal in business but it's like uh, also they have a lot of what they call offshore uh, services where they don't have really to have uh, a physical location of the bank in addition all Omani banks have partners here so they have like accounts in banks and uh, American banks have agreements with them so the banking system and the financial exchanges is not actually hindered by the fact of the lack of physical American banks here so that wouldn't be a problem and the business people will always find a way right <laughs> that's exactly right <laughs> thank you your excellency when it was in Riyadh, which according to the then chairman said, this is our most profitable bank overseas of any that we have, but we are counseling it because of our shareholders fear that there will be another 9-11 and we will be blamed because one of the perpetrators had an account with us or something or the money came through us. I hadn't heard that. And then five years later, he said, this is the worst decision we've ever made was to counsel that but it was fear and stereotypes of the negative uh, ones that drove that decision, unfortunately. You know, I that's the reason I actually was motivated to start, um, to start this institute, because after 9-11, there was just such, uh, such fear, and anybody, you know, anybody from the Middle East was suspect, and, and you could be in an airport, and somebody just, like, points you out and think that you're a terrorist. And I, I wanted to change that perception and, and really try to build friendships through business and education and culture. So I think, the, I think we've come a long way, though. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's no longer 9-11. But I, that, I hadn't known that, that it was fear out of uh, another 9-11. Yeah, so just one, one question regarding the, the different domains of uh, uh, trades and economy we can work uh, on between the US and Oman. I didn't see tourism as part of, of it, even though Oman has different attractive places, uh, geography, history, and uh, long uh, coastal yeah, line. Yeah. And um, so opportunities for U.S. companies was what I was mostly focused on, but you're right. I mean, that is a, a big selling point, I think, about Oman. Um, I've been to those absolutely exquisite hotels that have been built um, and um, you know I've been to many of the sites around Oman there's so much history it's so beautiful and I, I do believe that uh, you know coming out of COVID now that's I think it's important to emphasize that you're absolutely right um, and I, I don't know what exactly is happening now when as far as the free trade agreement goes as related to tourism but maybe there are companies that are wanting to um, you know started up again because a lot a lot of things slowed down unfortunately doing during covid um just to add on to what uh, his excellency was saying um, oman is part of the international banking system and the swift system and so it's very easy to move money between any country and the sultanate not just america uh, so it's companies have should have no uh, hesitations about getting involved uh, with the Sultanate. And also in, in terms of international banking, for example, we have HSBC, which is very active in the Sultanate, as it is here in the US um, and other countries around the world. So. Thank you. I believe, uh, Linda, you have an appointment with the Zoom, that's right? Simon. Simon. <laughs> that's okay, I knew who you uh, meant. <laughs> I, I do, I do, and I, I, I'm, so thank you, I'm so sorry. Don't shy, just tell them, you know. No, no, no. I want to go. Tell them I want to go. No, 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 no. I, I, I'm very honored to have had the opportunity. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's been very informative. I've enjoyed all of the discussions. I mean, I, a, a conference or something like this, when you go away learning something, I think is the, just the most valuable thing. But not just like, you know, just accepting it. It's like there was a back and forth that I thought was really important. So I was privileged to be part of this, and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you, professors. Thank you, all of you who bring those uh, important papers. And you show us today a lot of things, actually, about Oman 
Even we are Omanis, we don't know about it. You know, Linda, about it better than me. Anyhow, uh, this is, uh, we are going, we're coming now to our end session, and we just want to say thank, thank you indeed.